The number one thing that is wrong with the American diet is seed oils, these omega-6 oils. These are the oils that drive insulin resistance. And when you control insulin and you control autophagy, something very interesting anti-aging-wise happens, and it's that- What do you think is the worst food to eat before you start fasting? Like, what's, what's the worst thing you could do where it's kind of, doesn't matter that you fasted because you just had this, this, and this, you know, 16 say, hours ago. A bunch of fried stuff, especially like French fries yeah, uh, from a restaurant, especially because they use such bad oils. And what you find from fasting is that sometimes it's effortless and sometimes you just have gnawing hunger the whole time. <laughs> and the gnawing hunger, it's your fault. It's what you ate before the fast. Interesting. So in Fast This Way, I teach about these six big categories of food that are likely to cause cravings for you. And they don't all cause the same intensity of cravings, but these are foods that aren't as good as we think they are. Because we have anything you're gonna eat has three things in it, and most nutritionists only look at two. And I'm not picking on nutritionists specifically, dietitians are even worse, I'll pick on them. <laughs> these are the guys who feed you Jello with NutraSweet in the hospital. <laughs> but there's calories in food. And some types of, of popular wisdom say, well, eat food with less calories. Guys, calories are energy. Energy is what you want. And to say that you are somehow going to feel really good on a low calorie diet, it does not work. As a 300 pound guy who's lost way more than 100 pounds, I'd say I'm a 200 pound guy now, but you, you go low calorie, lose 20 pounds, gain 30, lose 30, gain 40. It does not work. It makes you miserable and it makes mm. you just, just cranky. So what's you the need solution? Calories. What's the solution then? Well, the solution is you actually eat enough calories and you eat the right kinds of calories. So well, let's assume your food has some energy in it. The second thing food has, it has nutrients. So it has vitamins and minerals and stuff like that. This is good. Now, most of the time we stop there and say, okay, you should eat more of this because it has, for some reason, some people say less calories and other people say more nutrients. But the third bucket is what matters. The third bucket is anti-nutrients or toxins. Mm. And it's not like any food is, is perfect, but some have more or less calories, some have more or less nutrients, and some have more or less anti-nutrients. And if you pretend like they don't exist, which is how most nutritional stuff is written, let's so eat this because it's packed with this, ignoring the fact that you could literally have a bowl of cyanide, and if you put some vitamins in it, they'd say, well, it's low calorie, it's high in vitamins, you should eat that. Mm. And so I teach people in, in Fast This Way, look, here's the things to look for. If you eat that, you're probably gonna have a miserable fast with low energy cravings and be cold. But if you don't eat that, you're gonna have a much easier fast. And then you start to realize, wait a minute, maybe I'm going to choose foods that don't make me hungry as soon as I finish eating them. And if you master that, even when you're not intermittent fasting, you're gonna have lunch. And instead of wanting a snack at two, you're like, I'm actually full until dinner. I just don't want to eat. So I don't think about eating. I don't reach for the cookies. Yeah. So instead of willpower, it's just biology. It's so much easier that way. What would you say would be the top three foods if you could only have three that you would eat before a fast, whether 16 hour or 24 it, hour? It would be definitely grass fed steak. There is nothing more satiating than animal fats or butter. Um, this stuff, it, it's full of nutrients as long as it's grass-fed. If it's industrial, it'll actually give you cravings. It's not good to eat industrially raised animals. So the idea that meat is good or bad, you got to know what meat, <laughs> um, how is the animal treated, and all that, it matters. I wish that it didn't matter. I wish you could just eat gravel, but it doesn't work. So this is something that is the most satiating. Something with a lot of soluble fiber in it. You can do broccoli if you want to. You can do some some vegetables, preferably cooked. Not all vegetables are going to have the same effect on you. So I talk about things like how the nightshade family of vegetables, which have been a core part of the Bulletproof diet, like, guys, watch out for that. If you eat bell peppers, you're probably going to feel different than if you eat cabbage. Mm. In fact, you'll feel very different. And when I say that, most people go, oh, wait, I guess that might be true, but we've just never thought about different, it. Different in a not feeling as good with the nightshades? Yeah. Bell peppers are in the deadly nightshade family. They're clearly not deadly, but they cause inflammation in many people. Mm -hmm. But in others, they handle it pretty well. Right. So I'm like, watch out for that. Uh, but for me, I would say, eat, give me some vegetables, give me some steak. And then the other thing that's going to be really good is anything with fat, dark chocolate, mm -hmm. uh, guacamole, uh, things like that. A salad with a really heavy dressing with real olive oil, not the fake stuff and with some extra MCT oil in it and some extra avocados on top. So give me the good undamaged fats, not a lot of seed oils. Give me some protein and give me some vegetables. You do that and you can cruise all day long. But if you say, oh, 
instead, I'm going to insert some kind of fancy raw kale salad. Kale gives a lot of people cravings. In fact, mm. it's not very good for you at all. In fact, have you ever eaten a huge kale salad and then being, I'm so full, I'm so satisfied, I'm just bursting with energy, I'm not going to be hungry for four hours? No. <laughs> Even if you even if you cover it in bacon, it still doesn't work. Kale has stuff in it that pisses your body off. It really does. And it, it's just how it is. It doesn't taste that good either. But even if you like the taste of it, it's not particularly a strong health food. There you go. And how does, from all the research that you've done, obviously you've tested this for 10 years personally, but from the research and the science, how does fasting the right way uh, play a role in anti-aging in your life and, and other people's lives? The number one thing fasting or intermittent fasting regularly will do, and remember, it doesn't have to be a super long one. 14 hours can start, 16 hours is good. We're not talking heavy duty, you know, living in a cave kind of stuff. And that will stop you from having insulin resistance. When you have insulin resistance, it means that insulin levels go up and your body can't hear them, so they go up higher. When your insulin is higher, your all-cause mortality um, goes up. In other words, your chances of dying from every disease you can think of happens. What insulin resistance means is that when there's energy in your body, your cells are weak enough that they can't make good use of the energy. And fasting fixes that problem. When sugar goes up in the body, it forms something called advanced glycation end products. It basically cooks your tissues the way onions brown in a pan. And we know this from 30 years of anti-aging research about the effect of excess insulin and sugar in the body. Fasting will fix that. But on top of it, there's something called autophagy. Uh, which is a, a core part of the recommendations I make, which is do whatever it takes to cause your body to turn its protein digestion mechanisms back on you. Because if it's not busy eating steak and eggs or you know tofu, if that's what you're into, it'll turn around and go, oh, there's some extra debris, some junk inside the cells, outside the cells. I can clean that up. And if you go a little bit longer, it says, you know what? I've got enough extra enzyme activity here I think I will take out the weak mitochondria, these little power plant generators. I'll take out the weak ones and replace them with young, strong ones. And you start upgrading yourself internally because the stuff that would have gone into digesting the food you eat every two hours because that's what someone told you to do in the 70s. Instead of doing that, you're eating the stuff in your body that makes you old. And when you control insulin and you control autophagy, something very interesting anti-aging-wise happens and it's that you actually have younger and more abundant stem cells in your body. So intermittent fasting has proven to increase stem cells, increases testosterone, human growth hormone, uh, and a huge swath of anti-aging mm. substances in the body. And like it's free. Yeah. It costs less than eating breakfast. And what's the, some of the new research about stem cells or the new developments that have excited you uh, that everyone should know about? Well, I've been pretty public about uh, doing a lot of stem cells. I've had my bone marrow taken out twice. and I've had You've been trying to convince me to do this for a while. I've been considering it. it. I, it'll still, change your I, life, I still need to consider more. It'll change your life. Uh, anyone with old injuries like that, I, I have just no bodily pain. And you, you get younger, and there's really intriguing new research about stem cells making brains work better, especially if you've had a traumatic brain injury, which I have had. And so you, you just get younger. And I can't tell you that it was stem cells alone that did this. I live, you know, a bulletproof life and all that. But I recently measured my brain's response time. This is an automatic response time. How quickly does the brain respond when a light or a sound comes on? So this isn't a conscious thing. And my response time is the average response time for a 20-year-old. The response time goes down with or goes up with age. So you get slower and slower as you age. So I have a 20-year-old's um, ability to respond to the environment around me, which is pretty remarkable. And I truly think that the stem cells helped with that. Wow. There's also things like arterial flexibility, where I have the average flexible arteries of a 24 year old when you just compare and I'm twice as old as that Lewis. So something is working. I think stem cells are a core part of the anti-aging thing. What's happening now though, is we're able to pull things that are like stem cells out of the blood instead of out of the marrow. And mm, that's a really? lot less painful. And then <laughs> I'm more open to that than the whole the sucking out of my bones. Yeah. It's spinning it up. You're asleep when you're actually, I was awake one time when they did. Oh, I was asleep man. The second time. So wait, what's this new, what's this new blood drawing stem cell that uh, you're talking about? It's still getting regulatory approval, but it's called uh, very small stem like cells. 
But uh, I, I'll show you the video sometime. And <laughs> I'm laying on the table, and the doctor has this thing, and he hammers it with a hammer. Oh no, I can't! And it goes. Eh, er, eh, er. And, oh, oh man! Every time I see that video, it's like it's the worst thing ever. <laughs> man, yeah, you go through a lot of pain to have uh, you know it, less it pain for the rest painful. of your life. It, really? It's really weird, Lewis. It's almost like hunger. Like you can look at something as pain or just weird. And when I really dug into it, like there's the strangest feeling in my skeleton, but it wasn't pain. It was just so outside the universe of anything you would ever or should ever feel that it, your body could say it's pain or it could just be like, that's different. That's That's weird. weird. Yeah. (laughs) So I, I can say I've, I've been through much more painful things than that. Uh, But the idea that, that we could have younger and more stem cells by skipping breakfast is a little bit less money and time <laughs> than that. And that's and why pain, I think it's pain. such an important practice. And what's this, uh, what's this blood uh, stem cell process then? It's not, it's not available yet, but have you tested it? What have there's you a, gained? There's a, a very few doctors um, who are, are offering it today. And I think it's in a bit of a gray zone from a regulatory perspective. So have you tried um, it? Very small stem like cells. Of course I've tried it. Uh, how do you everything. how do you feel about it? Um, well, I think it, it's hard to say to compare you know, A versus B. There's a lot more studies on getting stem cells from your fat or your marrow. Um, there's also people getting stem cells from like placental cords and umbilical cords, or placental, from placentas and umbilical cords. Right. Um, there, um, I have mixed feelings about that because if you're getting stem cells from eight different people, I'm like how how tested was that? And that makes all of my friends who do stem cells that way irritated that I would question it. Maybe it's perfectly good. I know a lot of people do it and love it. I, I just, in, in my mind, I'm like, what do we test for every little virus and every little bacteria? I and, and I, I kind of like the idea of growing my own stem cells, but that's not legal in the U S anymore. It was for a while. And that was the most effective. That's so crazy. It, it's coming down. We're, we're at like year one of, of an evolution that's happening. Kind of like cell phones. The, the first cell phone, yeah, you know, some some guy in L.A. in his Mercedes 300D convertible. The whole this, trunk is his cell big, phone. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> and it was like you know twenty five dollars a minute. Uh, but with stem cells, it's come down in price a lot. The efficacy is way higher, and it's getting better. It works better and better every year. But it still takes a doctor a lot of time to you know, get the needles in all the right places and understand your joints. And but man, it's it's you know a couple hours of relatively minor discomfort. But then you're better for decades. It, it's a yeah. really big deal, Lewis. And I'll tell you, if you fast before you do that procedure, you have less insulin resistance, you have a working metabolism, everything you can do in a hospital, whether it's a surgery, whether you get in a car accident, whatever, everything goes better if you just have a strong metabolism. Mm-hmm. And so like, what do we all need right now? We want more resilience. Resilience comes from biology. The people who are best at taking fat or sugar plus air, combining them and getting abundant energy. Those are the people who live the longest, have the best life. They have more opportunity for greatness because they simply have more electrons bouncing around in their heads to do stuff with. Mm. And it could power your immune system. It could power whatever you're doing in the world. But that's the core of everything I've ever done with Bulletproof, with all the content. How do you make yourself better at making energy? And it turns out Mm. sometimes not eating is part of the equation. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, everyone swears by the, the lifestyle slash diet that they live by that works for them. People who are vegan swear by it. And the ones who are super healthy have lots of energy. The ones I, who are vegetarian. Know, I, I feel ones... like vegans just swear. They don't even swear by their <laughs> diet. Is that just me? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, they swear by lots of things. <laughs> Sorry, because I'm just teasing you guys. <laughs> the, the, you know, the vegetarian diet, people who live a vegetarian lifestyle for a long time say that this is the best for them. People who are carnivore diets say it's the best for them. Keto. Is there a worst type of diet, even though some of these things might work extremely well for particular yeah. body types? What, what is the, the worst type of diet is the standard American diet. And mm-hmm. there's three things in it that are just horribly destructive. Sure. The first one is what sugar 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 is there but i don't think it's as destructive as the other two okay so i'll I'll give an order from the worst to the the best of the worst right so the number one thing that is wrong with the american diet is seed oils these omega-6 oils and canola corn 
soybean, safflower, sunflower, all the stuff that's in everything at the restaurant and most packaged foods at the grocery store unless you know buy from the right company. Um, it's full of these oils. These are the oils that drive insulin resistance. Mm. Your body takes these oils and they're all plant-based oils. And it says, hmm, I'm gonna try to construct the outer layer of my mitochondria and my cells, the, these little batteries, but I have the wrong ingredients. So I'm gonna make subpar batteries. Like if you go to the, the knockoff store and you buy the cheap batteries and it last a third as long as the good ones, that's what happens when you eat a lot of seed oils. Americans have about 40 times more of that oil in their systems than they should, and it gets built into your tissues. Eesh. And that makes you weak, it is just not good. Seed oils. Get seed oils are bad. Second thing is industrially raised meat. It's full of xenoestrogens. These are estrogens that make animals fat on one third less calories than normal. Um, it's also full of antibiotics and it's destroying the soil of the planet right now. Yeah. It also is depleting uh, farmland when we take and we grow corn and soy and grain and we don't actually put the animal poop back into the soil the way nice. we do on my farm. <laughs> what we're doing is we're sucking all the nutrients out of the soil and we're creating a, a very, very big catastrophe 60 years from now. We'll be out of topsoil because we stopped having animals walk around and poop on it the way it works when you're doing a regenerative agriculture kind of thing. But worst of all, you eat industrial animals, they're also full of cortisol. And so you do this, they mess up your gut bacteria and they're full of uh, glyphosate because it was on the feed and glyphosate disrupts your your gut bacteria, your nervous system activity, and is tied to cancer. So we're getting bad oils. Oh, and those animals, because they ate corn and soy, they're full of bad oils too. So now you're like, man, the steak tasted good. And I had that nice salad dressing that came out of a bottle that was full of crap oils. And you think you're being healthy, but you're completely wrecking things. And this is some of the stuff that I did when I was heavy, right? And then the third thing would be sugar, right? You just, yeah. if you have a ton of sugar, it's directly harmful. If you do the stuff I'm talking about, you can probably have a few grams of sugar and you won't notice that your body can handle it just fine. So right. sugar is not good for you and it is addictive, but it is way better to eat sugar than it is to eat corn oil. But really? don't eat either one. Don't eat either one, yeah. Have sugar every once in a while, Yeah, but don't eat oil and... I, yeah. Like if, if someone gotcha. said, here's a birthday cake, you know, it's gluten-free, I don't do gluten. Um, and they said, I made it with canola oil, I'd just be like, no. Right, but if they say I made it with sugar and butter, I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna have some. And right. it's that big, the sugar, okay, your body can process that and it's gone. The other stuff, it sticks and it gets in there and you don't wanna do it. So the worst diet of all is that one with lots of fried stuff and bad oils. But the second worst diet for people who think they're being healthy, Lewis, this isn't gonna be popular, but it is the vegan diet. Why is that? There's two things, okay, I was a devout raw vegan. Okay, I did this for more than a year. I mean, I have bowls as big as my head full of kale and blended and mashed and sprouted. And I mean, I, I'm good with rice and dates. beans and everything. Yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. So what happens there is your body doesn't get the essential fats that it needs. We are not made out of plant oils. And I have, I have in my books, I talk about the studies that show when you change the type of oil you eat, it changes what your body is made of. So when you go on a plant-based diet, you're getting two things. You're getting plant-based oils, which are not very compatible with you. Vegans will get mad at me and say, Dave, we can convert plant omega-3s to the good ones. Yes, it takes 45 grams of bad omega-3s to make one gram of the good ones if your body can do that, which it won't be able to do because you're on a plant-based diet. <laughs> and then you get tons of these anti-nutrients from plants that cause cravings. When I was a raw vegan, I was always hungry. <laughs> and I think that that's a, a very common occurrence. And I would say, well, that's weird. I'm going to put more coconut oil or, or eat more, you know, fresh uh, young Thai coconuts, all these yeah. things, <clears throat> avocados. It didn't matter. It's because plants don't want you to eat them and they cover themselves in defense systems that cause cravings. So I talk about the five big categories of things that are causing problems with us right now. And many plants that are common on a plant-based diet are not very compatible with humans. Like, oh, they have these vitamins. Like, yeah, they also stick to the stuff that lines the cartilage in your joints and gives you joint pain. Or they inhibit your ability to absorb zinc and magnesium and iron and things like that. And so what happens is you tell yourself you're doing this to be nice to the animals, but what you're doing is you're making sure that the animals will go extinct because if everyone was vegan, we'd have no animals. And then two generations later, we'd all be extinct because we'd have no animals to make soil because you can't grow carrots without animal poop at the end of the day. You can do it for 20 years, you can do it for 30 years, but eventually you have to build that soil back up. 
So what's happening on a plant-based diet is the wrong fats and lots of anti-nutrients. And that combination is kryptonite for people. And I've had tens of thousands of former vegans go bulletproof. And part of the reason I made the bulletproof diet was because I did harm to myself, including additional food allergies and worse hypothyroidism as a result of being vegan. Um, and in terms of animal cruelty, I calculated deaths per calorie from <laughs> eating a pound of grass-fed steak every day, which is a lot. You don't need to do that unless you're on the carnivore side of things, which there's an argument for that. Um, but if you do that and the cow is grass fed and local, unless the cow stepped on a frog, you kill less than one animal per year in all of your food. But if you eat boxes of processed soy nuggets, you disrupted the lives of whatever was going to live on that land and whatever the tractors killed. And so the number of deaths per calories is way higher for any grain product and any, anything other than basically fresh picked vegetables because of habitat destruction and tractor kills. And like, I asked a monk this in Tibet. I, I'm not dogmatic, but I want to do what works. So I like to minimize suffering, uh, buy from a local farmer, eat less meat, but make mm -hmm. it grass fed and eat very good fats. And if you do that, you'll never have a craving during a fast. And if you don't believe anything I say, you can still be plant-based or vegan and you can still be standard American diet. Dave, I like my industrial animals, you know, go screw yourself, just do intermittent fasting and you'll still improve. It works for any diet out there. And I'm happy to share the knowledge, and I've For sure. moved a lot of uh, a lot of information. There's 3,000 blog posts and stuff like that. But what I want people to do is figure out the foods that are compatible with your biology. And if you're one of the small percentage of people who's like, you know what, a vegetarian works for me. I know people, it really does. They eat some eggs, they eat some cheese, mm -hmm. they eat a substantial amount of butter, and magically, that really works for them, and that's okay. Right. But if it doesn't work for you, don't tell yourself it's supposed to work so you'll do it even right. more. That's the mistake that I made. Are you friends with uh, some vegans that you've had these conversations with or like Rich Roll or you know anyone like that? You know, who I haven't had Rich on the show, but I would totally do that. And I, I've certainly had conversations with, with vegans a lot. And there's, there's kind of two mindsets there. Uh, one of them says you're doing it for your health, right? The evidence does not support that. And here's what's really going on. And it's intimately tied to fasting. There's a compound in the body called mTOR. And you've probably talked about it on the show before. mTOR is a signaling molecule that says grow. It says, you know, build muscle, you know, build tissue. And when you eat protein, a lot of protein, plant-based plant will raise it, but animal-based raises it much more. So when mTOR goes up, you put on muscle. But chronic elevation of mTOR equals cancer, mm. right? So that's a bit of a problem. So one solution is say, well, I'm going to go plant-based and low protein. The problem with that is that mTOR gets suppressed, but it never goes up. So you get frailty. Like these are the people who break their hips. These are people who have the, the vegan sized pants for men. They're like little <laughs> stick legs, right? You don't, you don't want to be there. Right? So what's the solution? Well, don't eat for a while, then work out and then eat. And what's neat is that mTOR is like a spring you can push it down. And when it's down, it's good, except if it never goes up, it's not good. So when you push it down, there's three things that we know of that suppress mTOR. And this is how you build muscle and how you account for the difference in outcomes from vegans versus carnivores, let's say. So to suppress mTOR, fasting does it, exercise does it, and coffee does it. So what you do is eat dinner and stop eating around six. Don't eat after dinner. So you got four hours of fasting before bedtime. You sleep for eight hours. You just fasted for 12 hours. Wait another four hours. You, there, you, fast, you fasted 16 hours. You had a late breakfast. But before you eat, do some squats. Go lift. I mean, it can be a very quick workout, just something heavy. And then you eat. And because all three of those things push the mTOR down, as soon as you eat some protein, the body says, wahoo, and it spikes the mTOR much higher. And then the exercise has a bigger impact on your tissue. So you got more exercise benefits in less time. Your mTOR was briefly elevated because you only ate once that day or twice that day, and then it goes back down and it stays down. People feel good on a vegan diet because they suppress mTOR, which is driving chronic inflammation. Problem is you do that forever, you never get the muscles and the growth, and then you get the anti-nutrients and you get the bad fats. So it's okay to be vegan for a week. It's probably good for you. But then at the end of that week, maybe you should go carnivore. So cycles are good. Mm. And I will tell you, being all keto all the time is terrible for you. Being right. all vegan all the time is terrible for you. And I've done both. 
that's why intermittent fasting is so awesome because you can eat both vegetables. You can even have white rice. You can have carbs. You don't have to be in keto and, and ketosis and all that to do fasting. It's cycling in and out. So be vegan for a day, but just don't be vegan for a year and you'll be fine. What are the main plants that we should never be eating then? Okay, real quick. Uh, up until 10,000 years ago, we lived primarily on the leaves of trees and we ate tubers that grew in the ground, like a sweet potato for uh -huh. a yam. Mm, love those. Yeah, those they're actually so good. They're pretty darn good for you. you, know, you were actually designed to eat them. And Very good. 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, we switched over to things that we had never eaten before. And those were the grains of grasses and beans. Now, the reason we'd never eaten them before is, number one, we didn't need to. There's never been a documentation of an ape eating grass or mm. grains. Mm -hmm. Beans are so lethal that five raw kidney beans will kill a human being in five minutes by coagulating their blood. What? Five raw kidney beans. Raw kidney beans. In fact, you know, most people have heard of the poison ricin, the white powder you send to your elected official. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Lots on the way to Washington. Yeah, but that's yeah. another subject. Uh, so ricin is the lectin of the castor bean, and we'll talk about lectins next. A lectin is the plant defense system. These are proteins that are designed to huh. basically kill us in one way or another. Oh my gosh. And so ricin is so powerful that about four molecules of ricin will kill a human being instantaneously. There's a great st study that was written up in one of the journals about a few years ago. They decided to have a healthy eating day in Boston. Yeah. And they serve the kids uh, beans because mm. it's so healthy. Right. Part of the blue zone. Yes. And they had 30 or 40 admissions to the hospital. No way. With severe diarrhea, hypotension. And it turns out that it was all the fact that the beans were undercooked. And beans are a plant baby, and we're not supposed to eat those. And mm. so, no beans, no beans, zero beans, be unless you use a pinto pressure black yeah, beans. pinto black. None of that. We shouldn't be eating it. Shouldn't be. It. You weren't designed to eat it. You not, have no defense no system against it. No matter how it's cooked, it. if you pressure boiled, cook, pressure cook it, it's fine. Pressure cook it. What yeah. does that even mean? Put it in a pressure cooker. Pressure the cooker. modern pressure cooker is as easy as a rice cooker. Got it. It's one touch. It's not your grandmother's pressure cooker that blew up in the kitchen. And so then it's okay to eat. Yeah. So you can pressure cook beans. Now, the other thing, we weren't designed to eat grains. Now, and, just a quick question before you start there. How much of it can we eat? Does it matter once it's pressure cooked? Here. Obviously, everything in moderation, but I mean... Yeah, well, like uh, I was so, presenting... Like 20 beans are going to kill me or what? No, if the... you pressure cook them, they're fine. It's all good. Okay, yeah. cool. And, and we talk about how to do this in the plant Got paradox. It. Got it. Um, okay. cool. But my personal feeling is the only purpose of eating a bean is to get olive oil into my mouth, and we can talk about that Got as it. we go along. Okay. So grains, uh, for, for instance, everybody heard about gluten. Yes. All right. So gluten is a lectin. And again, a lectin is a plant's defense system. It's a protein that actually is designed to act like incoming guided missile attacks wow. on the inside wall of our gut. And these things actually pry open the lining of our gut mm -hmm. and actually break through the border. Really? Yeah, they really do. That's, and that's what it causes eczema and bingo. causes breakouts. Yeah, and exactly. Acne, all brain stuff. fog, uh, irritable bowel. Uh, this is actually all part of that process. Wow. And so it, it's fascinating to see people who either have come to see me or have even read the book and then write on Amazon, oh my gosh, you know, I had this horrible eczema and now a month later it's all gone and all I did was, you know, take grains and beans and nightshades away from my diet and mm. everything got better. So that brings us to the second kind of group of things we shouldn't eat. All of us are not from uh, the United States, uh, America. We're actually from Europe, Asia, or Africa. Mm -hmm. Every one of us. Yeah. So, and even our Native Americans are actually not Native Americans. Mm. They're from Asia. Mm. You know, get over it. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so, none of us were exposed to an American plant until 500 years ago when Columbus started trade. 
So getting to know a new plant, a new lectin in 500 years is speed dating in evolution. I just mm -hmm. don't think it would be done. For instance, the wow. Italians refused to eat tomatoes for 200 years after their native son Columbus brought them back because they knew how dangerous they were. They were part of the deadly nightshade family. Really? And they, when they started eating them, they always peeled and de-seeded their tomatoes because the peels and the seeds actually have the vast majority of the lectins. And huh. it, it's interesting. Years ago, I was uh, did my fellowship in children's heart surgery in London, England, and I had a, a house officer from Italy and he invited me up for pasta and mm -hmm. tomato sauce. Yes. And so I, I, I brought, you know, it'd be nice if I bought a couple cans of canned tomatoes, you know, help out. Sure. And he looks at it, he says, why did you bring me this? We can't use this. So I said, what do you mean? It's, you know, canned tomatoes. He says, it's got peels and seeds. You can't make sauce with peels and seeds. He says, oh, you know, mama mia, you know, what, what am I going to do with you? He says, you, you can't use peels and seeds. I said, why? He says, they're deadly. And I said, really? And he says, yeah, everybody knows that. And wow. then I thought back uh, as a child, my mother, wow. my grandmother was French and she taught my mother that you always peel and de-seed tomatoes before you slice them and, and serve them. So until I went to Yale, I had never had a slice of a tomato with a peel and a seed. Wow. And it, this was, you know, this has come from cultures. Yeah. For instance, peppers, peppers are the same way. They're part of the nightshade family. You'll never open a glass jar of Italian bell peppers and see peels and seeds because mm -hmm. they're gone. And the most striking thing is the Southwest American Indians uh, always peel and de-seed their peppers before they eat them. The hatch chili roast will be happening in another month. And what do they do? They roast their chilies, peel the scarred off part, de-seed them, mm. and then they eat them or they make them into chili powder. Right. And, you know, you can prove this in your grocery store. Buy a can of green chilies, chopped green chilies, open it up. You won't see any peels and seeds because yeah. they're gone. So tomatoes and um, peppers, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, and, and potatoes. You know, the, if, if you peel them and seed these things. You're safer, correct. Safer. But you can pressure cook them and they're fine. And they're okay. Yeah. Got it. Now, there's two American beans that everyone should stay away from. Peanuts are not a nut. They're God, a bean. so good, though. 94% of human beings carry a preformed antibody against uh. the peanut lectin. <laughs> we can take rhesus monkeys, our cousins, give them peanut oil, and they will develop atherosclerosis, heart disease. Really? If we take the lectin out of the peanut oil and then give them the peanut oil, they will not develop heart disease. So if you get lectin-free peanut <laughs> there, butter. There is no such Dang thing. Dang it. Okay. So get almond butter instead. Yes. It's much so safer. No peanut butter. No, stay away from you it. You should eliminate really it 100% from your Absolutely. system. Absolutely. We can take, and this has been done, Men feed them peanuts, take their bowel movements, feed them to rats, and you will grow cancerous cells in the rat colon because they've been exposed to the peanut lectin. Ugh. Yeah. I love peanut butter, though. Oh, I, I, you know. So I, I can have as much almond butter I went, as I want. And I went to medical school in Georgia. You know, Jimmy Carter, you know, man, yeah. peanuts are peanut everything sandwiches, in Georgia. You know? Yeah. Nope. Sorry. So eliminate do it. it. Gone gone say goodbye this will help me live longer have a happier healthier body and, and then system. i won't have to operate on you you know right. when you have coronary disease and oh you'll go gosh. what i eat so healthy i'm having my peanut butter how many surgeries have you done oh over ten thousand. Ten thousand. do you have the re is that what it is the record no not someone record. said it was a record yeah. heart surgery heart surgeries no yeah. no how many heart surgeries Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. yeah it's a lot of heart surgery. what's the cause of these heart diseases so and it's the a reason why you have to do so many of these it's all in the plant paradox. So 17 years ago, I met a guy by the name of Big Ed. It was a 38-year-old 30, guy who came to see me at Loma Linda because I'm one of these surgeons who will operate on anybody. Wow, um, Big Ed. Take the rip. Big Ed. 500-pounder? Big Ed, actually, wow. when I met him, weighed 265 pounds. Wow. But he had such extensive coronary artery disease that you couldn't put stents in him. You couldn't do mm. bypasses because there wasn't any place to land. 
and he was from Miami, and he'd be going around the country carrying his angiogram, the movie of his heart, his cardiac catheterization, and everybody's turning him down. And he finally, after about six months of this, comes to see me, and I'm looking at his angiogram, and I'm going, eh, you know, I don't like to turn people down, but everybody's right. You know, we're not going to do you any good. And he said, well, wait a minute. Here's the deal, Doc. I've been on a diet for the last six months, and I've lost 45 pounds. Now, this is a 265-pounder sitting across from me. It looks like a, you know, a biker, um, big gut. And he says, and I've, I've gone to this health food store, and I've taken all these supplements. And he actually brought in this shopping bag full of supplements. He said, you know, maybe I did something in here. And I'm going, yeah, all right, you know, I'm kind of scratching my professor beard and, <laughs> and saying, well, you know, I know what you, good for you for losing weight, yeah. but it, it's not going to do anything in here. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine. Right. And I exactly. really believe that. So he says, well, come on, you know, it's been six months. I've come all this way. What would it hurt to get another angiogram, another mm. cardiac catheterization? Mm. I said, okay. And so we, we get a new cath on him. And in six months' time, this guy cleans out 50% of the blockages in his heart. Mm. 50%. It's gone. Pretty good. It's pretty darn good. It's unbelievable. Oh, wow. For instance, statistically, on the best statin drug, you know, like Crestor, Lipitor, with the lowest levels of LDL, uh, we scientists at the American Heart Association get crazy if after five years your plaque burden has decreased a half of a percent. Wow. And we go crazy and we go, oh my gosh, this is a miracle. It's the greatest drug discovery of all right. time. <laughs> right. And we go, really? So this guy, 50% are gone in six months. So I actually was so excited. I operated on him and, and did a five vessel bypass. But what if I knew what I knew now, I'd say, hey, great. You know, another year, this will all be clear. Keep going. You won't need the surgery. So yeah, I, yeah. I start talking about what he did on this diet and lo and behold he, he gets started on this I said, oh, time out you know, I said I had this crazy thesis at Yale University that I did for four years back in the dark ages of human evolutionary biology and my thesis was you could take a great ape change its food supply and change its environment and predict you would arrive at a human being mm. and I actually successfully defended it and got honors blah 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 and so i had given it to my parents and uh, <laughs> went off to be a famous heart surgeon sure. and so he's talking about this i said, wait a minute you know this is my crazy thesis and here i am this big guy you know running and i had pre diet you were yeah this is 15 years ago yeah so 15 he, years ago yeah, yeah you know running and eating a healthy low-fat diet and why did all the doctors seem like they're bigger yeah exactly and yeah. you know we're giving all this advice and so i, I called my parents in san diego i said hey you know, you got this thesis? Mm. Oh, yeah, you know, it's in the shrine. <laughs> yes. Internal flame. The whole room of your accomplishments. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I said, send, send it up to me. So I put myself on my thesis, and I lost 50 pounds my first year. Wow. And I lost another 20 pounds subsequently, and I've taken it off. And then I started putting my patients who, you know, at Loma Linda, who I operated on, mm -hmm. on this program, and their blood pressure went to normal, their diabetes went away, their... The heart disease didn't come back. And so after about a year of this, I was looking in the mirror on one Friday and I said, you know, I can't do what I do anymore because I can teach people how to avoid me. Mm -hmm. So I actually resigned my position. My wife still calls it Black Friday. When was this? Uh, 15 years ago. You resigned? I resigned. From doing from, surgeries from or doing, from? being chairman of heart surgery at Loma Linda. Yeah. Wow. Just because yeah. you felt like... This I could wasn't do, solving the it actual It wasn't solving route. the problem. It was right. just putting a Band-Aid on it. The so, surgeries. The surgeries. Yeah. I was just, you know, it's famous for four-time, five-time redo surgeries on somebody who kept clogging up their blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And it's like. You could fix them up, but it's like. Yeah. Okay. They're going to be back in a couple of years. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I set up uh, an institute in Palm Springs where all I ask people to do is every three months, let me take about 10 tubes of blood out of you. And we'll send it to some labs. Mm -hmm. uh, have insurance will pay for it. Wow! And see what asking you to eat certain foods does, right. and asking you to take certain supplements that you could find at Costco or Trader Joe's does. Mm. And that resulted in my first book uh, in 2008 called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. But then subsequently, uh, I've seen about 50% of my practice is autoimmune disease and 
people would go, come in and say, hey, what do you know about autoimmune disease? And I'd go, oh, I don't know anything about autoimmune disease, but I'm a transplant immunologist, and that means how do I get the immune system of you to accept the heart of a pig, for instance? And I actually hold the world record for the longest pig to baboon heart transplant, 28 days. That's wow. the world record. Wow. So I started manipulating the immune system by food. And sure enough, um, you've got an autoimmune disease. We can teach you to get rid of it by changing, primarily getting lectins out of your diet. That's it, huh? And changing your gut bugs to be basically friendly gut bugs. And the friendly gut bugs actually tell your immune system that, hey, guys, we're all great down here. We're down at the beach. We're singing Kumbaya, the yeah. beautiful bonfire. And your immune system is basically the cops. Uh, and the cops go, oh, yeah, we know these kids, great kids. Uh, let's go have a donut. And now, so that's how it's supposed to be. But let's suppose a gang member moves into your neighborhood. Now, all of a sudden, you got, you're putting up bars on your windows and you got neighborhood watch patrols and you're shooting guys with hoodies without asking questions. So what's happened to most of us through some of the foods we eat, like all these wonderful snacks we're talking about, mm -hmm. we've, we've let these gang members loose. And the good guys actually can't eat simple sugars and these saturated fats. They, they want leaves and they want tubers. Mm, so what they die off. They die off, exactly. So the gang members are running rampant. And now your immune system is going, oh, my gosh, you know, the city's taken over by gang members. And we're going to have armed patrols everywhere. And anytime we see anything that looks a little odd, we're going to shoot and ask questions later. And so what's happened to everybody with autoimmune disease is their immune system is just hyper on guard because it's no longer getting the messages from the good bugs. Chill out. Everything's cool. You know, kumbaya, love, 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 peace and love. And that's what's happened. And it's, it's so cool to get somebody who can just, you know, change the food they eat. They may not want it initially, but when they start feeling better, yeah. they go, uh, for instance, on Monday, young lady, 36 years old, lives out in uh, La Quinta, mm -hmm. was sent to me with what's called chronic pain syndrome. Now, a lot of doctors toss this off as, oh, you're crazy or you're depressed or you're just anxious and you treat them with antidepressants. And she was in constant pain. And it was so bad that she actually had to work from home, mm. really couldn't move. And she had a kid and a husband. And right. so she had heard about me. She said, you know, I've heard about you. Um, you know, what do you think? And I said, you know, come on, let's, let's do this. I said, what's happening is that your pain is actually coming from nerve cells inside your gut that are being stimulated by rogue um, cops, if you will, and they're trying to tell you that you shouldn't move. Mm. Um, so let's start. So I saw her a couple of months later in January, February, and I said, how are we doing? She said, you know, the pain's less, but it's definitely still there. So I said, well, you know, just stay at it. If you mm -hmm. can feel a difference, don't give up. Yeah, yeah. So she, I walked in um, on Monday, and I almost didn't recognize her. <laughs> and I said, she got a giant smile on your face. I said, so, you know, how you doing? She said, perfect. I said, what, what do you mean? And she says, do you know what it's like to not have pain? And I said, well, yeah, I do um, <laughs> now. Uh, he said, she said, I forgot what not having pain feels like. Wow. And it, it's amazing. She said, I just feel great. I, you know, it's been so many years I'd forgotten what, you know, feeling normal felt uh -huh. like. She said, but let me tell you a story. You can't cheat. And, I, <laughs> and I, I, I said, yeah, I know that. But how'd you find out? She said, well, you know, there was this office party a couple weeks ago. And all they had, they had some, they had some chicken and they had some nachos and they had some guacamole. And she said, I noticed that the guacamole had tomatoes in it. Uh, believe it or not, guacamole is not half supposed to have tomatoes your your listeners should realize that guacamole <laughs> should not have tomatoes sure. but uh she said 
I figured, well, the safest thing to eat is to put some guacamole on my plate and have a piece of chicken because, you know, I want to be nice. She said, I'll tell you, within an hour, oh. my left elbow just started throbbing and then my hands started oh, freezing up. She said, I actually had to leave the party and go home. And she said, I had to lay down and I couldn't get up for about two hours. And she said, and I was trying to be good. And she said, it's it's amazing that, you know, this could do this. Wow. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. So you said you essentially came, was, uh, you know, we're doing heart surgeries, 10,000 of them, and yeah. said, I don't want to be offensive here. I'll make sure I'm saying the right thing. But you're now essentially a functional med doctor. Yeah, I don't. In, in a sense. Correct. Right? I, um, with, not, all, with all due respects to Mark Hyman, yes. uh, Jeff Bland created, the, uh, created functional medicine, and Jeff's a friend of mine. I don't know what functional medicine right, means. Right, right, right. What I do is restorative medicine. Right. All of us have the power to heal ourselves. Now, the guy who said this was Hippocrates. And Hippocrates, uh, brilliant. He, he believed that any organism had the ability to have perfect health. Hmm. And that every organism had the ability to achieve perfect health as long as the obstacles to perfect health were removed. Mm. And Hippocrates believed that the physician's job was to identify the obstacles to that organism having perfect health, the patient, and remove them from the patient. And right. the patient would do the rest. Yeah. So what, what I try to do, I basically do detective work and I think I'm pretty good at finding the obstacles and many of those obstacles believe it or not are lectins mm. and the other obstacle is you got to get the gang members out of your gut by basically starving them to death and giving the good guys what they want to eat starving them of the lectins starving them of simple sugars yes and lectins and saturated fats like you remove those things yeah they they have nothing to eat and they leave for instance i'll give you an example of something interesting uh, we actually have bacteria in our gut that enjoy eating gluten uh electric. really yeah they love it but if you go gluten free they leave because they got nothing to eat yes and then a lot of people who go gluten free and don't notice a whole lot of difference or they just get frustrated and then they and they have a couple pieces of bread or mm. pizza mm. and God, then all of a sudden so their gut goes oh you know well it's because <laughs> their bugs that could defend them against gluten are gone are gone mm. and it, believe it or not gluten is kind of a, a low level lectin there's far worse the the worst ones are in the hall of the grain so for instance this whole gr whole grain goodness this only started about 50 years ago. No and such we, thing as it, whole grain goodness. No, we've gotten sicker and sicker and sicker because the outside of the hall <laughs> has the lectins. And we've been throwing it away. I mean, really, the French, uh, seriously, would they have a whole grain croissant uh, or a whole grain baguette? Really? And the Italians, you know, whole grain pasta. Mm. Well, now it's appearing on the menus because the tourists want to see it. Yeah. But the Italians would kill themselves. Right, right. Yeah, the first thing I opened up right here is the most popular nut is not a nut, the peanut. The peanut. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Sorry. The and sign. a cashew. A cashew is a nut, too. I can't eat cashews? No. The Amazonian Indians always threw the cashew bean away. Uh, what, if, what if I eat, <laughs> manipulate it in a certain way and make it into a sauce? And, you could pressure cook it. I can pressure cook cashews. Yeah. Then I can eat it. Yes. And what stay away peanuts? from chia seeds. No chia seeds? No. These are all the things people are telling you to eat right now. Uh, of course. And that's why everybody's getting sicker. Chia seeds, there's two human studies that show that chia seeds promote inflammation in human beings. <laughs> what yeah. else do we need to be aware of? I used to be a big fan of chia seeds. What do you eat? So, you eat what you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to eat leaves. You're supposed yes. to eat tubers uh, like jicama, like sweet potatoes, uh -huh. like rutabagas. You're supposed to eat tons of olive oil. Ton, really? Tons. I use a liter a week. Of olive oil. Of olive oil. Well, you drink it or you're cooking no, with it? No, I pour it on everything. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. pour it on everything. The only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. This is what I told Dr. Really? Oz a few weeks ago. Just think the only purpose of food is to get olive oil in your mouth. In Crete and Sardinia, they use a liter of olive oil per week. 
A Spanish study of 65-year-old people for five years, making them use a liter of olive oil per week against a low-fat Mediterranean diet. At the end of five years, the olive oil users had improved memory compared to the low-fat diet. The women had 65% less breast cancer wow. than the low-fat Mediterranean diet. And they had less heart disease. Liter a week. Olive oil. Liter a week. That's, can't, a, that's can't the fountain beat. of youth, huh? Yeah. It really is. Tell me again the stat on diabetes, how many people have yeah. it or are okay. pre-diabetic. And, yes. and what... I'm uneducated on this. So how many different types of diabetes are there? Okay, and good. how is it caused? Okay, okay. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Pancreas fails. It's called, we should be called juvenile diabetes. Uh, and you need insulin. It's just... It's, you need it. It's, you need insulin. If you have type you, 1 diabetes, you need insulin. You need insulin, yeah. Because your what? pancreas dies. Because your pancreas makes insulin and helps your blood sugar uh, get balanced. Keeps That's the blood. It's sort of the gatekeeper that lets the, the glucose into your cells. Okay. So it's really important. Um, so how does that die? What, how, what how do people has, die from that? I mean, how does the pancreas die? Oh, well, it's how does it get to that point? It's an auto, like an auto, like you get multiple sclerosis or gotcha. arthritis. It's, it's basically your body attacks your pancreas. Is that and, from and, eating a lot of bad foods? Uh, well, there's been links to dairy and actually as an, a driver wow. of type one uh, diabetes, gluten, 29% of people who have type one diabetes have celiac that are undiagnosed. So wow. a celiac is a big cause of autoimmune diseases, okay. including type one diabetes. So that's a very small number of people. Okay. Very few. Um, one out of two Americans have what we call type 2 diabetes. We used to call it adult onset, except now kids as young as three are getting type 2 diabetes from drinking soda from the crib. I mean, oh, was, my gosh. I, I, was, I was working in, when I was a resident in an urgent care center, and this woman comes in for back pain, and she's got her baby in a carriage, and I see her feeding this baby this brown liquid in a bottle who's seven months old. And I'm like, what is soda? that? Soda? I'm like, what is that? She said, that's Coca-Cola. No. I said, why are you feeding your baby Coke? She said, well... Uh, he likes it. Oh my gosh! Oh my God, Lewis! I, my wife showed me this this uh, video on on uh, on social media the other day. It was of a baby, it looked like it was maybe eight or nine months old baby, having ice cream for the first time. Oh, having sugar for the first time, and you watch the baby eat the ice cream. I light up. The eyes, <laughs> and then the baby like grabs the thing and like stumps with his face. I was like, Oh my God! It was just so crazy, and it's it's highly addictive. So. Uh, yeah, so, so now we're seeing one in two Americans suffer from either pre-diabetes or type 2, or type two diabetes. And, and that is when you eat wow. too much sugar and starch. And every time you do that, it raises your insulin. Your body becomes resistant to the insulin, and so it doesn't work as well. So you need more insulin. Mm -hmm. And insulin does what? Insulin makes you hungry. It makes you store belly fat. It locks the fat in the fat cells, and it slows your metabolism. It's like a quadruple threat for your body to gain weight. So... It's why we're seeing, you know, and that goes back to what we're growing, right? So why are we eating all this food? That It's because that's the food we produce, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that's the other part of the problem. So we have the chronic disease. We have the economic impact. And then we're like, well, why do we have this food? So as a functional medicine doctor, I'm always asking why, right? Well, why are my patients sick? Because it makes money, right? Well, no, I'm, yeah, but, but I'm going right, even right. further. Why, like, why I got interested sick? in this? Because as a, why, why would a doctor care about agriculture and soil and all this crap? Because I, as I was thinking about my patients' diseases, most of them were caused by food and can be cured by food. Mm. So I'm thinking, well, well if it's how many, are, how many are most of them? Is this like 50%, 70%? 80% of okay, anyone would, that comes in to the hospital yeah. or your patients yeah. who has patient. some type of disease or yeah. some type of sickness. I mean, unless it's like an environmental thing like mercury or lime or mold. You know, most of the or things. Or cancer. Cancer, right. cancer is caused by food. Really? 70%. 70% of cancer is caused by food. And sugar is the number one culprit. Heart can, disease, can, diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, the big killers. Are now, by sugar and food. Yes. Yeah. So if you change your diet, you should be able to cure, prevent, those. prevent. Or cure sometimes. Sometimes cure. Depends how yeah. far along things are, I yeah. guess. Yeah. But you can prevent heart disease, Alzheimer's. 100%. Yes, 100%. I mean, the studies are there. It's crazy. Even people already have Alzheimer's when they improve their diet, they can wake they get up more get functionality yeah. back. So, so you've got me thinking, okay, well, if the patient's disease are caused by food, what's causing the food? It's the food system. And I'm like, well, what's causing the food system? It's our food policies. Mm. Like, what's causing our food policies? It's the food industry that's lobbying Congress. It's got money. It's the biggest lobby group in Congress is agriculture and food. 
by Ooh. far, like by twice as much as the next uh, lobby group. By like gas and oil or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And it's like, what? So then I began thinking, well, if I'm going to help my patients, I can't do it in my office. I, I can, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm like in the boat, bailing the boat with a hole instead of plugging the hole. Right. You're not so, going to the source. Right. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, what do I need to do as a functional medicine doctor? I need to go to the root cause, right? The root cause and why. And then it became clear to me that it's, it's our, our agricultural system that's driving so much of the problem. And, and the, what we grow has been based on good intentions that were in the 50s and people were hungry. There wasn't enough food. There was a lot of poverty. And so we, we figured out a system to produce an abundance mm -hmm. of starchy calories. So we can have food. So we can starve. have food. And we were great cheap. at it. And we have cheap, abundant corn and wheat and soy, which are the commodity crops that are turned into industrial processed food, which is now 60% of our diet. And for every 10% of that you eat, your risk of death goes up by 14%. Shut up. Yeah. So you're crazy. So you're basically, you know, feeding Americans a diet that we know is going to kill them. The research is so clear on this. There's no scientific debate. And yet we don't do anything about it because we have these dysfunctional food policies. And then the way we grow the food causes climate change. And we'll get into that. But the number one cause of climate change is our food system. Really? People don't realize that. I didn't know it. I'm like, right. oh, it's oil and, you know, gas and all this stuff. I'm like, but what is it? Is it the trucking? Is it the animal feces? End -end. Is it okay, the... so first of all, deforestation is devastating. Uh -huh. Not only do we, like, destroy the soil on which we cut down the trees, but the trees are carbon sinks, so we lose that. So they're not sucking in the bad air not sucking and putting in the out good air. Dioxide. Right. I mean, basically, plants suck out carbon dioxide. That's yeah. what they breathe. We breathe oxygen, they breathe carbon dioxide. So they're the perfect antidote, right? Yeah. And then... The soil also, we're damaging by the way we're farming. Mm -hmm. We've lost a third of our topsoil. Mm. It's responsible, and people don't know this, but of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the loss of soil, organic matter, like healthy, rich soil, is responsible for 30 to 40% of all greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Does that mean, why is that? Does okay, it like suck up? Does because, it suck? Because soil is, it can hold more carbon than is in the atmosphere right now. There's a trillion really? tons of carbon wow. in the atmosphere, which is a lot. I don't know, a trillion tons, I don't even know how to measure that. Uh, and the soil can hold three trillion tons of carbon. And how does it do that? It's an ancient carbon capture technology that is available all over the world, that's free, free <laughs> that uh, can be more effective than all the rainforests on the planet, than all the forests and trees on the planet, it's called photosynthesis. Uh -huh. And, it, and the, if you have like grasslands, for example, like we had big prairies in the United States, they suck down carbon, they breathe it, and they put it through the plants into the roots, feeds the mycorrhizal fungi, which then make healthy soil, feeds the bacteria, and you get this incredibly rich live soil that holds wow. a tremendous amounts of organic matter that is carbon, right? That's, I mean, carbohydrates comes from the word carbon, mm. which comes from carbo carbon dioxide, wow. right? Ding, 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 it all connects. And, Interesting. And so we've lost, we're, we were So if we don't have the soil for it to consume, yeah. then we, it just bounces off back into the yes. air, I guess, and just, we're just consuming yes. it in other ways. Yeah, and, and, and the soil can hold so much carbon. The UN estimated that if we took the five, of the five million hectares of degraded farmland around the world, if we took just two million of that, and spend 300 billion, which is the total military spend for 60 days mm -hmm. around the world, which is not much. Yeah. 60 days, two months of everybody's military spending. We literally could stall climate change by 20 years. Wow. Because of putting back, back the carbon in, in the soil. Uh, and, and not only that, it holds water. You see, mm -hmm. the, you know, in, 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 in Iowa and in the Midwest, did. there was floods that just destroyed a million acres of cropland that otherwise could have been fine if the soil could hold the water, but it just sits on the top where it runs through and we lose all this water. So that when you have a organic matter in the soil, it holds 27,000 gallons for every 1% organic matter in the soil per acre. So it's, it's an incredible water sink, it's a carbon sink, and we've lost all these soils, and it's because we're growing these commodity crops in ways that destroy soil. soil. We're tilling gotcha. the soil, we're turning over soil erosion, it runs off into the rivers, uh, it, it, we kill all the life in the organic matter by poisoning it with fertilizer, right. with pesticides, with uh, glyphosate, herbicides. 
and, and it's it's staggering. And then we have all these sort of unintended consequences. You know, we we started growing all this food, and we thought this agricultural revolution was great. All these chemicals are great. You know, fertilizers great. We can do all this good stuff. Tractors, big farms, more food, right. feed the world. Uh, it's backfired on us, wow. and it's producing the worst food on the planet. That's causing devastating environmental damage, staggering climate change. So it's it's the soil loss. It's you said add deforestation. It's the factory farming of animals, which is should be banned. <laughs> right. It's the transportation, storage, refrigeration, and the food waste. I mean, food waste in a lot of waste. Yeah, but well, we we waste forty percent of our food. We really That's throw on a plate. We don't ma- eat imagine it. going to the grocery store, buying a bunch of groceries, take and getting home and throwing forty percent of the garbage. The average Americans waste eighteen hundred dollars of food a year, and it's about a pound a day. Uh, and that goes to landfills. The landfills then it rots and creates methane. So you could be a vegan throwing out your food waste and scraps, and you could be contributing to climate change. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the U.S. and China. Wow. Yeah, it's methane to produce, uh, and and we need to compost. We need to have community garden. Like it's always to fix it. But it's it's like when you look at the whole end to end food system, it is the number one source of climate change. About fifty percent of greenhouse gases. And people just don't appreciate that. So why, I mean, if this information is public and it's out there and policymakers are aware of it, they're not, they're they're not not aware. No, I I spent two hours on a sailboat this summer with a senator, a smart senator. He wasn't aware of it. And I I literally, his jaw was hanging open the entire time. Are they not presented with this research and information? No, because they got so much money sent to them by the lobbyists probably. Right. I mean, listen, if all the people who are walking their office are Monsanto, and Cargill and you know McDonald's and Pepsi nice. and like and they're all donating millions of dollars, I would say billions of dollars. Um, they're not hearing the other side of the science. And you know, how do you how do you fight that? So, you know, I, I always said deride it obvious, but I, I plan on, you know, of creating a food fix campaign, which is a nonprofit, along with an advocacy organization to start to literally lobby senators, congressmen. Uh-huh key people in the administration around these issues and start to drive policy change. Because in the UK, and you were talking about, I think in Australia, New Zealand, or in, I think in Asia, you were saying that you can't do certain things with the food, otherwise you'll go to prison, you'll go, to, you know, you'll get killed, <laughs> yeah. you'll... Well, yeah, I mean... Like in the UK, I mean, they don't have a lot of these dyes, and, right. You know, right? Yeah, so it's so funny, you know, and the FDA, you know, is so influenced by the, the food industry. Um, and, and I was once with the, uh, the, the former... Uh, Head of the Federal Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, uh, Peggy Hammer. Former. former. She, she was. She was. You know. She, but then she was the FDA commissioner. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but now she's former. And I was at the World Economic Forum. I said, Peggy, how how come um, you know we have uh, so much trouble with with getting advances in food labeling or dealing with toxic uh-huh. chemicals in our food or the antibiotics in animal feed or you know it's like she's like well uh, when we try to make too aggressive change. Congress threatens to shut down our funding because of the food lobby. They threaten to f- shut it down? Yeah. And then what? If Just, they shut it down, what would happen? Well, they, they, they're limited in their ability to do their job. Oh, and so the man. FTC, the same thing happened. In the 70s, there was a movement by the Federal Trade Commission to have uh, you know, negative edu- I mean, posit- I mean, education campaigns around sugar and how bad it was. But the Congress says, we're going to pull all your funding and shut you down if you if you do this and so they pull back so so uh yes. you know in in the, you know for example you asked the question about asia uh we have this thing called grass which is generally recognized as safe so the food additives we have you know we have you know thousands of food additives um only about five percent have actually been tested for safety in the u.s some of them are grandfathered in right like so crisco for example trans fat was grandfathered in as a safe food to eat. But it took 50 years for researchers to finally prove to the FDA that it wasn't safe because wow. it was the basis of all processed food, oh. right? Crisco shortening, you know, it shortens your life. <laughs> so oh short. my gosh. And, and so they, they, they literally had to be sued by a scientist in order to actually turn it into a non-safe substance. Mm-hmm. And then, they, of course, they gave their food industry years and years to get it out of food. So it's, right. But 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 in this country, there's so many things that are used in our food supply that are banned in Europe, like BHT, butylated hydroxytoluene food additives, uh, various dyes, and something called azodicarbonamide, which is a th- softener that makes like bread more like fluffy and soft. Yeah, yeah. 
and it was using Subway sandwich. Our friend Vani Hari outed them and said, this is your yoga mat material in your Subway sandwich. And they got it taken out, pretended right? to eat her. Yeah, and she got it out. But the FDA still says it's fine to eat. Right. And in Singapore, if you use it and you're a food producer, you get a $450,000 fine and 15 years in jail for putting it in the food. That same ingredient. The same ingredient. That anyone can use in the U.S. right now. In the now. U.S., yes. And most of the things that are safe, quote, safe here are banned in Europe. So it's like, yeah, they're not doing their job. And then antibiotics, you know, we have 30 million pounds of antibiotics are used in animal feed, we have about 37 million total. So about 7 million for humans to treat disease and 30 million for animals, why? For growth, it's a growth factor. Right. It makes them fat and it makes humans fat too. And it is used for prevention of, from overcrowding. And, and the FDA says, well, this isn't a good idea. I mean, nobody thinks it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but they go, well, would you please, pretty please not do it? It was a voluntary guideline that the FDA produced, not mandatory. Please don't do it, yeah. You have to have a vet certify that the animal's sick before you give them antibiotics. Oh, man. And now they, they, they you know, continue to do it and just laugh. You know, they had voluntary, the, 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 the um, FDA, uh, FTC put in voluntary guidelines around junk food marketing. Would you pretty please not advertise <laughs> the bad stuff and advertise more good stuff? It was just voluntary and the food industry went ballistic and had it overturned. So even the voluntary guidelines are nullified. Like, no, wow. Hmm. And it just, it's- I it, mean, sugar, I mean, it's like, I'm the first one to raise my hand when I say like, I love sugar and it's my, everybody my biggest does. vice, right? Everybody like I does. love cookies and candies and cakes and brownies and anything you can think of, I love it, right? You know, we, we programmed I don't know why sugar. I don't have diabetes. So much sugar I've had in my whole life. But you I can't be having that much because you look pretty good. <laughs> well, I train hard too, right? I go through waves. And, but as a kid, I would drink like nine, 10 Dr. Peppers a day, I remember. What? Like some days in the summer, you're just sitting you around. You could have been president. It's not what our president <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but I would just, I mean, I would run around and, and work out and play sports, but then yeah. I would just drink because yeah. I thought that's but what you was were on eight, You were 16, 18. You're like, and I was like nine, 10, right? So oh. I was like, but it was. You'd see it on commercials like your NBA superstar yeah. drinking Dr. Yeah. Pepper or Sprite yeah. or whatever after on the basketball court. And I don't know if it was just like subconscious or just it tasted good and you didn't think about it. it well, just, they, all, I mean, this is where the food industry is so, I mean, I talk about it in my book, Food Facts, but the food yeah. industry is so strategic about how it advances its mission and goals. And it does it through multiple channels. And I, I'm just going to go through them because it just people just don't know. The celebrity first, endorsements, right? Yeah. The first, you know, obviously, you know, celebrity endorsements, which is the obvious one. They co-op social groups. So they, they fund mm -hmm. groups like the NAACP and Hispanic Federation. The, you know, African-American and Latino communities are the most affected by diabetes mm -hmm. and obesity. And they co-op them by funding them. I, I want to show the movie Fed Up at yeah. the King Center in Atlanta. And Bernice King, Martin King's daughter, was all about it. And she was excited. But once, uh, once we got it scheduled a few days later, I got a call that we couldn't show it. I'm like, why? She's because Coca-Cola funds the King Center. No. Yeah. I went to Spelman College, you know, which is African-American Women College in Atlanta. And the dean said to me, half of the 18-year-olds coming into college have a chronic illness. Mm. Obesity, hypertension, diabetes. 18-year-old women. And I'm like, why is there soda machines all over the campus? Why? She was because Coke funds... No. And one of, the, wow. one of the people on the board of trustees is one of the highest executives at Coca-Cola. Coca oh, man. An African-American woman. It's like, so they co-op social groups. And that's why they, for example, oppose soda taxes because they're, they're in the, you know, in the funding of these, these big soda companies. And then, of course, they, they fund research. So they fund 12 times as much research, $12 billion worth of research a year to study nutrition. So Gatorade gets studied by Pepsi. <laughs> really? Gatorade's the best thing in the world. It's not. It's just sugar, right? Or, right. you know, right, right. So er, the, it corrupts and pollutes science. So people are confused. Why is there so much confusion about nutrition science? Third, they, they, they create front groups, they call them spin doctors. So they create front groups that seem like they're independent groups, like Crop Life. Yeah. Or, you know, like they're tweeting. the Center for Consumer Freedom. Right. Or the American Council on uh, science and health, which, by the way, is uh, run by a bunch of doctors who suggest that uh, pesticides are safe, that high fructose corn is great for you, that uh, smoking doesn't cause disease, and you know why like, do they do? Why would they do that? Because they get paid a lot. They're funded by Monsanto and Big Food and Pepsi. You just look at their funders. 
And they're just, I mean, they spent $30 million fighting GMO labeling in California, this wow. front group. It was all funded by Monsanto, right? And then you, so you got these front groups. And then you have um, them co opting scientists and academies. So the Nutrition Academies, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, their funding in large part comes from industry. And, and so the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is our main nutrition association, 40% of their funding comes from the food industry. Mm. You know, they, they have sponsored, you know, lectures at their meetings that are, you know, with people saying, well, high fructose corn syrup is good and diet drinks are good and like, right. it's just completely corrupted. And so these professional societies give guidelines and they're, they're corrupt. And Dr. Ioannidis from Stanford, who's a, an epi- a scientist who looks at carefully at the research and, and conflicts of interest says, you know, the, these professional societies like the American Heart Association and Diabetes Association should not be making guidelines. And then so you've got all these ways in which they sort of screw things up. And then, of course, they, they are aggressive in advertising and marketing, which mm-hmm. is illegal in most countries. And then they have lobbyists running around Washington driving policy that supports all of what they do. So you, the, you've got this massive effort. And, and it's often subversive and illegal. So started Food Babe. This started, was only a couple years ago. Yeah. And, and, and I just started writing about things I was really passionate about, and I started to realize I had a knack of asking questions nobody was asking before. Mm. Like, like, what were some of the questions? Well, no one had really asked Chipotle, I guess, publicly, online, mm. um, what's in your food? You say your food's with integrity, but what's actually in your food? What mm. are the ingredients? No one had done that. Do some of these previous. companies not show ingredients? I thought they have to show ingredients, don't well, they? Well, um, they or don't. Or do they hide them? Or it's like they really don't. Hard to find, actually, or? you know, really? they don't. Not all of them do. And so there's big, huge companies like Papa John's mm. who don't release their ingredients online. However, their competitors like Domino's and Pizza Hut do. Okay. And um, Chipotle, back then, when I started asking the questions, didn't. Right. And thankfully, because of my investigations, they started labeling their ingredients GMO or not, and started removing some of the bad ingredients, and they're getting rid of the majority of bad ingredients I I wrote about, the ones that were very controversial. When I realized someone as large as Chipotle or Chick-fil-A or Kraft or any of these big companies were listening to someone like me, I knew I could no longer stay at that job. And you started this at the other job that you were doing, right? And then it started started to pick up. And I remember when I first heard about you, it was something about craft. Like you basically changed the whole thing that craft does now. And uh, I want to talk about that in a second. But but I also saw, I remember you doing a video, like eating a yoga mat and then, (laughs) and talking about some word that I can't pronounce. And then later, seeing like three months later, seeing Subway come out with a commercial saying they no longer have that ingredient because you were specifically talking about it. And I thought to myself, wow, if one person can create enough uh, of a conversation so that a large company like a Subway or a Kraft or Chipotle or Chick-fil-A listens and takes action to change something, I said, that is really powerful. And uh, you've worked uh, in kind of solving a lot of the issues with Kraft, Subway, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, and Starbucks, and having them change their ingredients. And what was the thing with Kraft? What actually happened? Well, one of the things I realized, um, as soon as I quit my job, which was the scariest thing ever, by the way, because I wasn't, this was a pure passion project, so I didn't know how to sustain myself when I quit my job. And I was in the house, uh, and I was sitting here, and I'm living in a condo surrounded by the banks that I used to work with in downtown Charlotte and going, oh, my God, I have no boss, I have no job, and I'm a food activist now. Mm. Wow, this is crazy. I cannot believe I'm doing this. You know, when you're working on a passion project out, you know, and you're also working in the corporate world, you're not putting your 100% effort into it, even yeah. though it's like kind of taking over your world and your thought and you're sure. sitting at work and you're thinking about your next investigation instead of what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Like that started to happen, but I was still like straddling these two jobs, you right? You take the leap. Right. Yeah. And then when you put your 100% focus mm-hmm. in something, wow, the doors just start opening. Sure. And so the first thing I started to investigate was how food in Europe is healthier than the United States. What has happened is 
Europe has been um, regulated on a precautionary principle that these chemicals are considered guilty before they're innocent. Here in the United States, they're innocent until proven guilty. Huh. And so in Europe, there are several chemicals that are either banned or not used or have warning labels. And one of those chemicals is artificial food dyes, yellow okay. five, yellow six, they red They don't 40. use any of them there? Or they're labeled specifically with a well, warning? Well, they label them with a warning. Okay. So um, they are banned in certain countries. But oh, wow. in the UK, they have a requirement that you have to put a warning label on it that says may cause adverse effects in activity and attention in children. It's kind so, of like c cigarettes, basically yeah. a warning on a cigarette box. Right. But it's a warning on a box of candy or a wow. box of mac and cheese. Like if you were to import a box of mac and cheese from the United States to the UK and, and sold it in a specialty store, it would have to have that warning. But you know what Kraft did to try to get away with the, without putting that warning? They reformulated their product without yellow 5 and yellow 6 and used real ingredients, paprika and beta carotene, for, for European citizens, but not for us. Why not? So they found out that there was this health issue, right, associated with mm -hmm. especially children. Who Who's the biggest population of mac and cheese eaters in this country? Children. Children. Yeah. And to say, you know what, instead of putting that warning label on the box, we're just going to reformulate for them, and we're not going to do it for all of these millions of people in the United States is immoral and wow. unethical. So why do they do that? Because it's a lot more expensive to put the natural ingredients in, I'm assuming? And it is a little bit more cost, but mm -hmm. in the long run, it's not that much. I mean, right. These corporations are making billions of dollars right, right, exactly. collectively. So it's um, it's really unfortunate hmm. that these companies have gone unregulated like this, and it's up for us consumers to hold them accountable. Sure, if we keep buying, they'll keep selling it to us. That's right, yeah. that's right. And so I started a petition and... Um, Against Kraft. Yes, to remove these artificial food dyes. And I tell you, it was... So you weren't saying don't don't make mac and cheese anymore, no, don't no, sell no, us this. No. You're just saying take these specific ingredients out right. that other countries don't have in their foods. We should be able to eat junk food without the risk of hyperactivity sure. or cancer because some of these artificial food yeah. dyes are contaminated with carcinogens. You know, we should be able to have things without them harming us. Right. And so I tell you that period of time really changed me because what I realized quickly, we the petition got over 200,000 signatures in a week. Amazing. So and you posted on your site or online with yep, the petition and people right. and sign on, online. Right, on change.org. I actually okay. used change.org back then. And they were an amazing partner. Um, and they really helped carry the message. And they really helped guide me, too. I'm like, what do you do? How do you do a petition? And how do you do all these things? And now, actually, I'm teaching some of those principles people, in yeah. this book. Like, sure. how, how do you start your own petition? Interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's, That's a, really there's cool. an appendix in the back. At, um, Very cool. Of, in the back of the book. But um, So what happened with these 200,000 names? Did you say... Hearcraft, like, look at this, or what was the next step? Well, they continued to be really um, basically sending us PR, can I say bullshit on sure, this program? Sure. PR bullshit to us. And actually, the story of what happened when I went to go deliver those petitions to their headquarters is the first introduction chapter in this book. Wow. And it's, it's, it's gut-wrenching. Okay. Um, you know, I don't hold back okay. on how I felt right. when that was happening. Sure. And um, the, the really unfortunate thing with Kraft is that they weren't really willing to hear all of these consumers. Now this mm. petition has close to 400,000 signatures wow. still to this day. They're starting to slowly take out the artificial food dyes. They've taken it out for kids' products, and they've taken it out for their deluxe products, and I think they're going to eventually get rid of the rest. Sure. It's just going to take them some time. But, um, you know, what's really... Uh, the most critical point of that petition, what it taught me, is that there are thousands of people really being affected by these issues. Mm. Um, thousands of parents sent me letters. Their kids' asthma went away. Their kids' wow. eczema went away. Their kids' activity improved at school. Their kids got off their ADHD medication. Their, their autism lesson, the, the, the symptoms of autism. I mean, right. let personal letters from parents. I actually took those with me printed them all out. It was mm. a stack this big. Took them to, with me to Dr. Oz, the show, and, wow. and like waved them in the air on camera at Kraft. And what happened? 
Well, that's when I had to go deliver those those letters and that petition. And when sure. I was carrying those boxes of signatures, I mean, I really felt the weight of those parents mm. and those children that have been affected by artificial food dyes. And yeah. it still remains a problem today and a problem that I'm going to continue to fight for. Wow. That's incredible. What do you feel like has been the biggest challenge with all these companies that you've been addressing with the artificial ingredients or the ingredients that are healthy? What do you feel like has been the biggest challenge so far? Which company has been the biggest challenge to work with? Which, uh, you know, and which one has been the most uh, enjoyable, I guess, if you could say that, to work with or has been actually willing to listen to you and take your counsel and say, okay, we do want to make changes. What are some suggestions? So let's, let's start with the positive. So uh, a few years ago, there was something in my fridge that I had no idea what was in it. Uh -huh. And it was a bottle of Newcastle beer. Everything else I knew what was in it, but the Newcastle beer had no ingredient list. Mm. And I was like, well, why doesn't it have an ingredient list? And knowing what I knew about the food industry and how GMOs have infiltrated everything. What's GMO stand for, just so people know? A genetically modified organism. Okay. And have just been... Where you know, scientists have created an ingredient to then go into the food. That's right. It's a, it's a new species of plant, that's basically. Not, they, they've that injected, we designed. That's right. It's yes. not from nature. This, yes. is, this is in a laboratory. They inject either mm. DNA or insecticide or some other type of uh, concoction and put it into a seed and then grow that as new. Amazing. Okay. So... Um, and, and the problem isn't so much that technology, it's not even about that, it's about the, the fact that they're paired with an increase in pesticides. So the chemical companies who have developed those seeds are the same chemical companies selling the pesticides. Okay. So it's a pesticide issue. It's really not about... G it's, it's not about GMO. It's not about biotechnology. Okay. It, it's really about the pesticides. And the pesticides is what is really causing a huge environmental impact and the, the rise in cancer rates. If you look gotcha. at the president's cancer panel, who independently looks at cancer rates, has said that 41% of us are destined to have cancer. Some of those reasons wow. can be related back to these environmental toxins. With pesticides is one of them. So if it says GMO, does it mean it has pesticides attached to a GMO? Or so the GMO, is the GMO bad or is it just a pen? It, well, it, I mean, it is creating new proteins that uh -huh. have never before existed. So it's different for your body to yes, digest right. and it, it may react There are, there certain, are certain studies that show different things. And okay. what's really concerning to me is that there's no mandatory safety testing on GMO crops in this country before they're introduced. All the other countries around the world, they have this. Things. They 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 require it or they label it, right? Okay. They either say no, you can't you can't sell this here or you can't uh, grow this here, or we have to label it so consumers or have to warning, know. Warning: This may cause certain right. issues. But here in the United States, these companies are spending millions of dollars to prevent their name from being on there. Yeah. Like they don't want an, us to know sure. that genetically modified foods. I mean, think about it. The Super Bowl is happening, right? It's yeah. it's around this time of year. And think about all of the companies that spend millions of dollars to put their name right sure. there front and center. The biotech com companies and the chemical companies are trying to take their name away from this. They're sure. trying to hide this from us. Wow. So you've got to wonder, why are they trying to hide so much? I'm interested though, you know, cigarettes, they have a, a big tax on, I believe here in New York, they have a big tax on them um, to buy cigarettes. And also they have a big warning label. And a lot of them have like people with like cancer on them. It says you will, you know, Cigarettes cause death even maybe, I'm not even sure exactly what they say, but there's big warnings on them, but people still do it. Do you think if those warnings were on our food labels uh, in the US that we would still eat it, just like people are addicted to cigarettes? Well, the them? GMO label is not even a warning label. It's just a uh, transparency label, uh -huh. just to know what gotcha. you're buying. Gotcha. I mean, it's like how you know that you're drinking orange juice from concentrate. Okay. We should know if our food's genetically engineered. And yeah. so when, um, when these same food companies did this in Europe, they're still selling food there. It's just labeled there, gotcha. so consumers so you're more know. educated. Yeah, gotcha. absolutely. Okay, so, cool. so it's not you know this is a smart business decision for companies, especially to give them this information. But right. I tell you, there's something funny going on if they want to hide it so bad. So that's okay. that's your first kind of when you start to investigate, you kind of wonder, well, what's going on here? And okay. when you look deeper into some of the studies that have been done, 
they're very alarming and very concerning. And now we're seeing the main ingredient, Roundup, which has glyphosate in it, in human breast milk, Whoa. which is a huge toxin. I mean, linked to autoimmune disorders, cancers, all sorts hmm. of things. So this is a huge issue. But okay. going back to that Newcastle, Newcastle beer. Newcastle, tell me about it. They had no idea what was in it. Sure. So I was like, why don't, why don't beer, why doesn't beer, alcohol, wine, liquor, why doesn't any of it have ingredient labels? Why can't I know what makes this raspberry flavored vodka or this beer? And so I started to investigate because it was the one thing that was in my fridge that I, I wasn't personally drinking. My husband was drinking. I care about his health. And um, was looking into what was in there. And I remember going, it took me over a year, almost maybe maybe a little bit less or a little bit over a year to quiz the beer companies enough to even write an article about what I found out about the beer industry. And what I found out was shocking. Hmm. Most of it had GMO corn added to it. So it's not the basic ingredients of beer, you know, mm -hmm. malt, barley, you know, et cetera, yeast. Um, in water, um, it had uh, it had caramel coloring added to it, so they could use a different kind of malt. Just like Starbucks. Yes, just like Starbucks, and um, it had artificial dyes added to it. Uh -huh. It had um, different types of propylene glycol um, added to it, which is a derivative of antifreeze. Um, there was things that vegan and vegetarian people would be concerned about: ice and glass, which is uh, produced from a fish swim bladder, mm -hmm. um, carrageenan, which is linked to intestinal inflama inflammation. So all of these things were in beer that I had no idea what was in it. Because it wasn't on the label. It wasn't on the label. So I felt like this needed to change. That okay. blog post, when I wrote it, went so crazy viral. Mm -hmm. Millions of people saw it. And I realized that people are really fed up with this. And so I reached out to Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors. Oh. And at first, they wouldn't respond back to me. They gave me the, the basic mumbo jumbo. Sorry, we're sure. not going to release our ingredients. We're not going to tell you because it's proprietary information. Wow. But as soon as I did a petition and got close to, I think, 40,000 signatures overnight, oh my gosh. they responded. And it, the first to respond was Anheuser-Busch. And they were, when you asked who was really nice to work with, mm -hmm. they were incredible to work with. Wow. They, um, they emailed me right away. And I told this whole story on the blog, so if you look at old blog sure. posts, you can read this story. But they emailed me right away, and they invited me to their headquarters. To, In St. Louis? Yes. Yeah. And to learn about their processes. Very interesting. And look at their ingredients and meet their head brewmasters. So, you know, I went and did that uh, on my own diamond dollar. You know, wasn't consulting or anything like that. I went there, and I met with them, and I've been trying to convince them to develop an organic beer that isn't contaminated with any GMO ingredients. So That's interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, are they taking any ingredients out, or are they doing anything different, or is it still the same thing? Well, are they, they labeling it? Well, they are posting all of their ingredients online okay. now. Um, they've slowly started adding all all the beers on there. I think they're almost all the way up there. So if you go to tapintoyourbeer.com, I think that's their website, okay. you can see what's in their beer. And some of the things are, you know, really bizarre, like high fructose corn syrup in my beer. I had no idea. Right. You know? I mean, think about all the people who read um, packages and avoid high fructose corn syrup, and they had no idea that they were drinking it in beer. Sure. Now they do. So what are some other meats that you recommend that we should be eating? Meat is, I'm oh, sorry, foods that you recommend foods. we should be eating. Yeah. I think then the next best would be tubers, like roots, mm -hmm. sweet potato, rutabaga, parsnip, turnips, etc. cetera, um, because they are, they're generally fairly low carb. Um, sweet potatoes are? Sweet potatoes are a little bit higher in carbs. They're, yeah. they're way less than, than grains. Uh -huh. But a lot of these, uh, like the rutabaga and so forth, they're, they're fairly low carb. Sure, gotcha. Uh, and they're also gluten-free, and they pretty much fit into any regimen. So if you're, if you're on an autoimmune diet, if you're on a lectin-free diet, if you're avoiding nightshades, the, the tubers are still safe. Mm -hmm. What are the top tubers? Sweet potatoes? Uh, s sweet potatoes, potatoes, mm -hmm. rutabaga, uh, turnips, parsnips. Uh, what's the other one? The celery root. Okay. So those are generally pretty good. And again, if, 
so the, the sweet potato is generally more safe than the potato because the potato is a nightshade. Mm -hmm. So if you, again, have those sensitivities and you're avoiding nightshades, then potato has to go as well. Okay, so we got the tubers. What's the next category you really like? So then, assuming that you're not sensitive to nightshades, then I would go with all of the non-starchy vegetables. So now we got eggplants and bell peppers that, that I think for most people are good foods, but again, they, are, they have some lectins. Mm -hmm. Then I think the broccoli and cauliflower are like staples uh, in, in my house for sure. That you those can, are low, those, I mean, those are like very low calorie, yes. nutrient dense, but also low carb too, right? I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean. Broccoli, uh, cauliflower, they're like four or five percent net carb. So it's gotcha. very, very low. Yeah. And of course, avocado, mm -hmm. which is really a fruit by, by definition, but it has quite a bit of fat and very, very low carbs. It's like mm -hmm. two, three really? percent net carbs. Okay. And what's the deal with the nightshades? Because I know there's a big... Uh, um, you know, conversation about that right now where these, these foods actually are hurting you, you know, these nightshades, or it depends on your sensitivity level. Correct. Right? They're hurting some people. The plant paradise, right? Yeah. Correct. Yes. So then I don't know what the percentage would be, but I would not, I think gluten hurts everyone, mm. right? But I don't think lectins hurt everyone, not at those doses. Again, it's, it's all about smaller doses, dosage. Yeah. So nightshades have lectins, and if you are sensitive to something, if you have inflammation, if you have some issues, then I think sort of like the, the carnivore. You do, carnivore is more extreme, but before that, you want to try cutting out the lectins, cutting out the, the nightshades. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, it's not... Some people sort of pick their little niche and, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the lectin guy, I'm going to be the nightshade guy. And they, they promote that as the solution for everyone, but it, it's not. It. And, and low carb is not the solution for everyone. I have some skinny patients that need to eat carbs, carbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? They don't need to eat sugar and white bread, but they, they would probably do better eating 70, 80, 100 grams of carbs. Because mm -hmm. they're yeah. very, very insulin sensitive. Their body has trouble putting on some weight. Right. Are there any other categories you think we should be eating? The, the leafy greens are kind of mm -hmm. in the, the non-starchy vegetables, but they're, they're sort of a little subcategory. And then I think uh, some people kind of count the the eggs with, mm -hmm. with the meat, but I, I yeah. think it's a separate category because very few people are sensitive to meat. A lot of people are sensitive to eggs. People are sensitive yes. to eggs. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and again, it's not a majority. It's not, mm -hmm. like, not like with wheat or, or pasteurized milk, but I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20%. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's hard to tell because the people that come to my clinic, they're the ones who have the problems. Mm -hmm. So they're probably way more sensitive than, than the general population. Sure. Are you a big fan of eggs yourself? Yes. As a food group? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think quality is huge. I think a lot of problems develop because people eat really, really poor quality. Mm -hmm. So. I think if the, if the chicken or the hen had a healthy life and produces a healthy egg, I think you're much less likely to ever develop a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. But if that chicken is eating chemicals and hormones and was raised under horrendous conditions, I, I think your body is much more likely to develop a sensitivity to that because of whatever might be in there. Right, right. Any other final category you like? As a food group, as the, the most nutrient-dense foods. Yeah, I do think even though dairy is a very common allergen, 
I do think a lot of people do well with some forms of dairy. So I typically recommend yogurt mm -hmm. and sour cream mm -hmm. because it's very rewarding. If you're doing a low carb diet, then adding a little sour cream to something is, is super tasty. Mm -hmm. I think cheese is okay for a lot of people, especially if it's like a good quality cheese, not the, the melty singles right. and all that. But not the nacho cheese dip at yeah. the movie theater, which tastes so good, but it's not that good for you. Yeah, I don't even know about that. <laughs> it's not even cheese, yeah, right? Yeah, I think I've trained myself into just associating chemicals with, I know. with that stuff. I know. But yeah, I, I try to get things as close to nature as possible. So mm. if I have the option, I'm going to get pasture-raised eggs. I'm going to get raw cheese with as few additives mm. as possible. Because okay. nature made things for us. We, we are nature, right? And all the other animals on the planet, they graze off the planet. They don't process things. They don't alter things. So as soon as we change it, we increase the likelihood of screwing it up. Mm -hmm. And the more we change it, the more we screw it up. So right. the closer we can get to, to the source, the, the better. Yeah. What would be three foods that you would recommend everyone eliminate? If you could eliminate or have very, very little every once in a while, but if you could almost eliminate these three foods from your mm -hmm. diet, it would help you in a big way. So I don't know if we can call them foods, okay. <laughs> but obviously sugar. Uh -huh. Uh, sugar in the quantity, refined sugar in the quantities we eat is, is absolutely toxic to the body. Number two would be processed fats. So healthy fats are natural fats, butter, meat fat, pork, avocado, olive oil, etc. Because we don't change them, we don't mm -hmm. mess with them. But anything that we make an oil from that doesn't, necess that doesn't come easily, like a seed or corn. Corn has just a couple of percent fat in it. So it takes a lot of heat and chemicals and processing to get any oil out of it. So mm. it tastes terrible. And then you have to bleach it and deodorize it and, and all that. So it, it's not a food anymore. And, and those foods are extremely toxic. So mm. soybean oil corn oil, canola oil, all of those processed oils, and especially if they're turned into a food product like margarine or shortening or something like that. Okay. So I put, I'd say sugar and, and seed oils. And then something, again, that's not really a food, but I would, I would put it up there. And every time I make a video on this, I get a lot of backlash. And it's artificial sweeteners. Oh, man. Why are, and, why are artificial sweeteners and people, not good for us? Because they are chemicals. Mm -hmm. They're foreign substances. They were developed by companies who made pesticides. And, and the latest and greatest, so, so aspartame got a bad rap, so then they had to hustle to come up with something else, so they came up with sucralose. And they were very careful to name it in a way that like sounded, sugar. yes, sucrose, sugar, sucralose. But the fact is, and, and, then, <clears throat> and then they said that, well, you know, it's just like sugar. And then it just has some chlorine, just like Ooh. sea salt. Well, in nature, sodium chloride is only bonded through like an electrostatic charge. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's not like a tight bond. So yes, sodium chloride, perfectly natural. But when we bind chlorine to a carbon, nature never does that. Basically every form of a chlorocarbon is a pesticide. And one of the most famous ones was DDT which was banned as a cancer-causing agent. It almost wiped out the national bird, wow. <laughs> the eagle. And it's so toxic, it's in our environment 50 years later. So chlorocarbons are pesticides, and that's what sucralose is. It's mm -hmm. a chlorocarbon. Wow. So eliminate refined sugar, eliminate processed fats, which is mostly seed oils and artificial sweeteners. Are yeah. there any non-sugar sweeteners, yes. natural, yes. that you like or recommend that 
in the right doses are okay for you. Yes. So I use quite a bit of stevia. Uh -huh. That's not an artificial sweetener or it is? No, no. So some people bundle it together with artificial sweeteners just because it's a non-calorie sweetener. But it is a plant product. It's just a refined leaf, basically. Mm -hmm. And the thing to watch for, though, is that they don't mix it up with a lot of other chemicals, that it's sure. the, the concentrated version. It's one ingredient, not Correct. 10 ingredients. Yeah. yeah. And, and another similar one would be monk fruit. Uh -huh. That is also very similar in the, in the way it tastes and, and looks and so forth. It's super, super concentrated. Uh, and it's also a, a plant extract. So if you're going to add something to a coffee or a drink or something, Correct. stevia, monk fruit, yeah. you say is, is okay in the right doses. Yes. Okay. And then in the gray zone, I would also put sugar alcohols. Interesting. Right? Okay. Uh, some of them are better than others. I think the best one would be erythritol because it is very slightly metabolized by the body. So it doesn't really affect blood sugar, but it doesn't really cause any other problems. Some of the other sugar alcohols, they sort of stay in the digestive tract for a while, and then those sugar alcohols become food for your mm. intestinal bacteria, and that's where you get a lot of bloating. Gotcha. So I would say sugar alcohols are okay if you eat them in moderation. So this, this is always the, the trick in recommending food. When you, you make a list and people want to know the best one and yeah. the, so forth, and you, you categorize it and rank them, and now they say, that is a good one, I'm just going to eat that. Or Dr. Eckberg said sugar alcohols are okay, so now I'm going to eat that every day. I'm going to mm -hmm. bake with it, I'm going to buy the ice cream with it. And, and, and that's the thing, everything in, in moderation. So sugar alcohols, if you eat a teaspoon or a tablespoon here and there, I think it's totally fine. But if you start baking with it and doing the ice cream and you start getting half a cup a day, now you're definitely going to upset the, mm -hmm. the biome a little bit. Now, what matters based on your age range? You know, if someone's in their 20s versus I'm in my late 30s, almost 40, you're in your, I believe, 50s, you said. Yeah. Does it matter based on how old you are of what you should be eating, uh, how much you should be eating, types of foods, or is it pretty consistent throughout the decades? I, I would say it's pretty consistent throughout. And one, one analogy would be that, I mean, there's so many people, they say that women should fast this way and teenagers should fast this way and women over 40 or under 47. It's like we love to complicate right. things, <laughs> right? But are there different foods on the savanna for one giraffe versus another? <laughs> An older giraffe and a younger yeah. giraffe. Does, yeah. the, does the male and the female giraffe eat from different trees? Mm. It's like, not really. What would you say are the, the, the brain foods that would actually help increase our mood, the function of our mood, to feeling better, not in an addictive, I need this all the time, McDonald's hit, right. but overall calming, happy, healthy mood. Well, I think the you know, omega-3 source is huge. You know, we know those are really necessary for brain health. So, you know, oily fish uh, are, are the best sources. I think there are some of the mushrooms, you know, the one, uh, most studied is lion's mane, which is yeah. a very good edible mushroom, but that really looks as if it improves cognitive function and protects the brain. I think uh, anti-inflammatory agents um, like turmeric, mm -hmm. ginger are great. Olive oil is Olive good Olive oil, of course. Do you take supplements yourself? I do. I take a, uh, you know, a multi-nutrient supplement. Mm -hmm. I take CoQ10. I take uh, magnesium. I take a number of mushrooms formulas really and you make them yourself i don't make them but a friend of mine does and i'm 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 a great believer in mushrooms and their medicinal benefits how long have you been studying mushrooms geez probably since the 1970s also uh you know i first became interested in uh well i grew up my mother was very fearful of mushrooms as many people were you know she said don't even touch them you'll get poisoned really yeah 
And uh, so I first got interested in food mushrooms and then uh, started when I began reading about Chinese medicine to see how much they were valued in Chinese medicine. And in Western medicine, we never paid any attention to them. So that interested me. And I began looking at, you know, what, what are the effects of these things and why are they so much loved in Asia? And they're really interesting. You know, they, these, a lot of these affect immunity, resistance to cancer, viruses. You know, they're just, they're great. So um, I began, you know, I beca really became knowledgeable about mushrooms. Really? Yeah. So you take them daily or weekly? You take yeah, them? I take, yeah. Oh. And I eat mushrooms whenever I get the chance. Mushrooms are powerful, huh? They're real powerful. There, wasn't there a documentary called like The Magic Power of Mushrooms or something? Yeah, I'm Did sure. You see this on Netflix, there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's how many species of mushroom? Countless. I don't think we know. Thousands, all of them. right? Yeah, thousands and thousands. And the percentage of them that can kill you is very tiny. So when you go out, you know, when you learn to pick wild mushrooms, the first thing you want to do is learn the ones that can kill you. Right. And those are fairly easy to learn. And then once you learn those and avoid them, you can experiment, and the worst thing you're going to get is a stomach ache of one sort or another. For a few hours, and you'll yeah, be fine. Yeah. Um, tell me, tell me, talk to me about teas because I'm interested in teas sure. and the power of teas. And what is the purpose of tea, and why do people drink it so much in general? Okay, first of all, tea all comes from one plant. Uh, it's Camellia sinensis, the tea plant. A lot oh. of things we, people call teas are herbal infusions, you know, that aren't made from the tea plant. So chamomile tea is not tea. It's not tea. Rooibos tea is not tea. What is it? It's just herbs. It's an herbal together. infusion, you know. But when, but if you're talking strictly about tea, it's all from this one species of plant. Where does the species grow? It can grow anywhere. Well, it's or... yeah, it's native to China and India, uh, mm. but it can. I hear people are cultivating tea in Oregon now. Uh, I haven't tried any of it yet uh, anyway so it can grow over a wide you know in, in, in it can't take frost but it can grow in you know of a lot of it mm -hmm. a lot of different areas okay. but then there are many varieties of tea depending on how the tea is grown how it's treated whether it's steamed dried roasted toasted uh, how long it's oxidized mm -hmm. and you've got like everything from white tea which is very delicate green tea oolong tea, black tea, um, and, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different preferences. When I was growing up, tea was what old people and sick people drank. Right, right. Or iced tea on the golf course. Tea with a lot of sugar yeah, in it, yeah, right. Yeah. And the, uh, the only tea that we had available, you know, was tea in bags. And, and that's the common stuff is literally the sweepings of, from the floor of tea estates. Mm. So it's been only relatively recently that people in this country have become aware of good tea. Uh, what are the benefits of tea? Why, why drink tea? Well, it's agreeable. I mean, throughout for centuries, people have found it to be agreeable. It's a stimulant. It's got caffeine. Uh, all tea, or I guess all, all true tea has caffeine. So some has more than others. Like a mint tea that's non-caffeine. That's not that's mint. Not that's tea. not tea. That's there a, is, however, mint flavored tea. So you know, got to read the label. You but know, that's with caffeine. Yes, if that's it's with tea. Caffeine. It has caffeine. caffeine. Right. Now, the stimulation, however, of tea is very different from that of coffee. Coffee has more caffeine in it, but they have different other things in them. And tea has a compound called L-theanine that you've probably heard of. That's yeah. a relaxant. And I think that combination uh, really affects the, the quality of stimulation of caffeine. So it's, oh, so it's got caffeine, which gives you sharper energy, right. but also a relaxation. Yeah, so, it's so like people, a, you know, I think it describe it as a relaxed alertness. Interesting. Different from the stimulation of coffee, which I personally think is much more jangling. A jittery alertness right. versus a exactly. calm alertness, right. a focused alertness. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the ob other observation I make, I don't want to bash coffee too yeah. badly, but uh, I see an awful lot of people who are addicted to coffee, or physically addicted. You know, if they try to stop, they have a withdrawal syndrome. You know, it's like a lethargy and then a pounding headache and it can, you know, lasts for 48 hours and instantly relieved if you have some coffee. Right. You don't see that with tea, you know, rarely. You're not like, I need my tea this morning. Yeah, I need exactly. it. <laughs> rarely. I'm on my first right. talk about tea. Exactly. <laughs> and also, uh, when I was actively seeing patients, I, I used to say that I would produce one miracle cure a week by getting somebody to stop drinking coffee. And it was from everything from hand tremors to irregular really? heartbeats to bladder problems, GI problems, stomach problems. 
a whole range of stuff, and they had no idea that the coffee was doing it to them. <laughs> you got you got them off the coffee, and they were like, two weeks later, they were fine. Fine. And and these were often problems you're, that had gone on for years, and nobody, people's had, hearts. and nobody you're, had ever told them, though. You're breaking people's exactly hearts. Exactly, <laughs> right. But also, there's a huge variation in how people respond to caffeine in general, and coffee in particular. I, I see people who have no idea that the one cup of coffee they have in the morning is the reason they can't sleep at night. And I see other people who can drink a pot of coffee at bedtime and fine. So you got to find out where you are on that spectrum. Yeah, I can you know, have a cappuccino at night, after like 10 o'clock, and pass out the next So hour. you're relatively caffeine insensitive. Yeah. Uh, so, so, not that I need it. I no, just right. like little yeah. taste or whatever. And I wonder, and, I, and I'll drink it in the mornings, and it doesn't like give me more energy. Yeah. I feel like I have energy. Right. But when people say they get energy from coffee, it's their energy. You know, <laughs> coffee just bunches it up. And when it wears off, you're left with a depletion of energy. Really? What do you mean it's their energy that bunches it up? It, caffeine isn't giving you a gift of coffee isn't giving you a gift of energy. What's, what's it's like it's forcing your body to give up chemically stored energy that it would normally not release all at once. Like stored where in the fat cells or in the no in in all cells in in it's in all cells in com energetic compounds in all cells. So but when you when you release that energy, then when the, when the drug wears off, you have a depletion of energy. That you and you feel become. tired. Yeah, you have a crash. So and why does tea not do that specifically? Probably because it's first because it's less caffeine, so it's gentler stimulation, mm -hmm. and it's also got this other compound that moderates the the thing. So I guess you can find, you could find tea addicts. I don't see them very often. Right. Uh, and I don't see many people who say they get a crash from, from tea drinking. What, uh, and, and also coffee does have, you know, there are health benefits of coffee, but there's been a tremendous amount of research on health benefits of tea, like especially what? green tea. Like what are the benefits? Overall lower death rates. Really? <laughs> yeah, there's a, a huge population study in Japan is that, that because should, of the tea or because of all the other factors, the environment, well, and friends? We, and we don't know. Uh, but there's, there's a clear association between the more tea people drink, lower <laughs> causes, all causes of death. It's got improved cardiovascular health, lower rates of cancer, uh, you know, all sorts wow. of stuff like that. And of the various forms of tea, personally, I think green tea has been most studied. Here's the thing. When I drink green tea in the morning with no food, it makes me feel a little upset. Like I've thrown up before. I have heard this from I've heard this from people. I can get a little nauseous sometimes. I hear this from people. So you want to have food in your stomach, right? That's a fairly simple fix. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, why is that? Do you think? Is I it, don't know. And with it's coffee, not, I'm fine. I mean, interesting. Like I don't I know. I can drink why. coffee in the morning and not eat all day. I do not know why. Huh? Maybe there's a compound in the tea Possibly. that's stimulating Possibly. something. Possible. Interesting. So my preferred form is matcha green tea, which is the powdered tea. Yeah, but matcha doesn't make me feel sick. Okay, I good. I like matcha. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. You got to try our matcha, which is the best. Which you got, you guys have, I mean, the best domain in the tea world, which is matcha.com. Yeah, well, it was a good score. And <laughs> why? Why is? Why did you get in? How did you get into okay, matcha? When I was 17, uh, I was on a student exchange program. This was 1959. Rotary? No, actually, it was an experimental school called the International <laughs> School of America. <laughs> Your uh, whole life just sounds yeah. woo woo yeah, and yeah. out there, which I love. This was great. I got to travel around the world for uh, nine months and live with native families yeah. in different cultures. You didn't speak changed, the language. My, changed my life. Well, anyway, it's uh, for a quick story there yeah. before you tell it. My dad. We had seven exchange students live with us when I was a kid. Yeah. So it's like, we didn't have the money to travel. Right. But, but you like, brought it to you. We brought it to me. So we had people from all over the world teaching us the culture and the food. There's and no the it substitute was for that. Amazing. No, no substitute for that, for amazing. knowing about other other cultures. Yeah. Anyway, Sorry, so ahead. I lived with, uh, with Japanese families outside of Tokyo and Kobe. And the Japanese family outside of Tokyo, uh, there were supposed to be... A, st a student studying English, but there was no language. No one spoke no, English. No one spoke English. So the second night that I was there, <laughs> the mother, through gestures, made known she wanted to take me next door to her neighbor who was a tea ceremony practitioner. That's so cool. the th it was cool. So the three of us sat around, um, and this woman in kimono made matcha. So first of all, the color of the matcha just blew me away. I mean, it's this brilliant green powder. I'd never seen green like that. And then the whisk that they whisked it in a bowl to a froth is a marvel of Japanese craftsmanship carved from a single piece of bamboo 
And th that whisk just, oh, I loved, I wanted one of those. So uh, I then in the 1970s, I began going to Japan fairly regularly for different things. And whenever I'd go, I'd bring matcha back and turn people onto it. Nobody had ever heard of matcha. And I'd, I'd make it for people. And somewhere in the 80s, maybe 90s, I started importing matcha from a company in Japan that I met and selling it on my website, drwild.com. Way ahead of its time, you know, there was no awareness of matcha Before at all. Starburst made it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but then watching matcha suddenly become popular here, I was amazed, but also disappointed that so much of the matcha here was terrible. Well, it's just sugar infused. Well, and... also the matcha itself, because it's such a fine powder, it's got a huge surface area. It oxidizes very quickly. So if it's not stored properly. Uh, mm. it, it loses that ring color, becomes sort of yellowish green or gray green, it gets bitter. And a lot, that's, a lot of people, that's all, the only matcha they've tried is stuff like that. So I uh, really wanted to turn people on to good matcha. What, so, are, what are the benefits of matcha in general? Well, it's the only form of tea in which the whole leaf is consumed. Um, and it's got a higher content of antioxidants and flavor compounds than that L-theanine than other forms of tea. So it's grown in an unusual way. It's like they're, they're special tea plants. Uh, and uh, starting about three weeks before they harvest it, they cover the plants with shade cloth. It's about a 90% shade cloth, so pretty dark. And in response to that, the leaves get bigger to try to get the sun. To get it bigger and thinner, they produce wow. more chlorophyll wow. to try to make more energy, and they produce more antioxidants and more flavor compounds. And then the leaves are harvested, steamed, dried, um, aged, and then they're ground between stones. It used to be done by hand. Now they're sort of mechanically Machines, driven, but, yeah. but it's gr these grooved granite stones to this super fine powder. And so it's uh, you know it's a special form of tea that has higher content of all the good stuff. I'm going to have to come to Tucson and have you make me some I would sometime. love to do whisk that. It, whisk it up for me. I would love to do Or that. just go to Japan and, I'd love and to do uh, find a right. specialty place. And, but and meantime, run. you can get it from our uh, website, matcha.com. Yeah. Matcha yeah. There you go. And do you guys teach how to make it too? Yes, and there's sell instructional the videos. And we sell everything. The bowls, and everything, everything. Everything's all there. That's exciting. Yeah, that's fun. So it's been fun to turn people onto that. So why matcha over jasmine or green what's the i think it's personal preference taste? whatever you like i like the, the I, first of all i just like the look of matcha i yeah. like the taste of it i like the ritual of of okay. whisking it yeah well you can do it any way you want the, and is it you know the starbucks way is like you put almond milk in it or something but how would you is this with water is this with yeah milk? just well, i i like it just with water no sweetener that's just my way i like it i also like iced matcha uh sort of i use an electric whisk in room temperature water and then put ice cubes in it and, and really? then when it's hot weather i like that a lot wow i like to drink green things <laughs> what's, what's the um are you drinking a, a one tea a day? Do you have I'd say one a day. For you? Yeah, yeah, usually one a day or early in the day. I mean, occasionally I'll have another one, but I usually don't need more than one. What's your nighttime ritual? My nighttime ritual? I eat early. Um, early I, what's that? Five, like seven? Four to five, I would say. That's your dinner. Yeah, I like to cook. So in, even if I'm by myself, you know, I usually cook for myself. Simple stuff, but I, you know, I like simple, delicious things. So, uh, and I like cooking for other people. And then after dinner, um, I like to often read, uh, watch movies, depending on the weather, of course. I mean, if it's up a full in BC and it's light till 10 o'clock, I'm, you know, outdoors and. Right, right. You're living the dream. You've done so many diff different interesting things. What's the thing you're most proud of that you've created? You know, for the world? I, 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 there is now a center at the University of Arizona College of Medicine named the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. That's pretty cool. Yes. That's pretty cool. And uh, we're the world leader in education in this field. Wow. You know, as I said, we've graduated uh, over 2,000 physicians from our trainings. We train medical students. We train, we have our, our curriculum in 80 residency programs. We train other health professionals. We train, uh, you know, chiropractors, dentists, nurses. Uh, in integrative medicine and you know as I've always said one day we'll be able to drop the word integrative it'll just be good medicine and that's coming and integrative is 
Is that the exclusion of medicine, like traditional medicine? No, it builds on conventional medicine. So you still can prescribe Absolutely. traditional medicine. Yeah, you know, we, we, if I've always said if I'm in a serious car accident, I don't want to Maybe first go to a, yeah. to a Christian science right, practitioner right. or a chiropractor or shaman. You know, I want to go to a trauma center <laughs> and get put back together. But then I'd use other methods I know to speed up healing. Right. So uh, I think the, frankly, I could, see, one of the things I can see happening, uh, I think that, um, a lot of uh, smaller and community hospitals aren't going to be there in the future. I think nobody's going to be able to afford, you know, that stuff and that what we call conventional medicine, allopathic medicine, that may become a specialty for dealing with trauma, for critical illness, mm -hmm. and there'll be one large facility in cities that has all the hardware. And uh, there'll be new kinds of institutions that'll come into right. being, you know, that I think of as healing centers. So that's, that's one possible future. You've seen the obesity go up in America huh. since the last 50 years. Yeah. It probably wasn't two thirds back then. It was probably about one third maybe or not even. I don't know what it was back then. Well, I remember now, watching, right? you know, a few years ago, I watched the whole uh, Ken Burns uh, documentary on World War II. Okay. It was on PBS. And there are many crowd scenes, both military and civilian, thousands of people. You don't see a single fat person in those crowds. Is it because they didn't have the money to buy food? Is it because they're, no, you know? No, it's not. And, you know, it's, the other interesting thing is if you look what people were eating in those days, they didn't know a lot of what we know now. They weren't so, processing food as much, too. Right? So, yeah. So, I mean, but people ate, you know, they were eating potato, meat and potatoes and Rice pies or, yeah, and whatever. Yeah. But it was real food made from scratch. You know, they were not eating manufactured food. They weren't eating fast no, food. There was no fast food then. Right. But there's an enormous change in how people looked. You know, I, I read, I read there was a book that came out a few years ago that was trying to argue that the obesity epidemic was an artifact of statistics, the way we were measuring people. Bullshit. <laughs> you just look at this. You know, it's right. like unbelievable how how people have changed. Everyone was fit or looked thinner right. back then. Right. Right. And now everyone looks yeah. fatter. Yeah. What do you think's gonna what do you think in the next fifty years? we're going to be as a country in terms of obesity. You know, I saw, I saw, uh, uh, this was a couple of years ago, I read that the military is really having problems finding people who are qualified for military service because of obesity. Come so on. if it's really, so if it's threatening national defense, you'd think, you know, it, it now people are going to take it seriously. We've got to do something. Just because they're not in shape enough to yeah. pass the test, yeah. the physical test. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're in such a mess in this country with regard to food and nutrition. It's hard to know where to start. <laughs> where I would start is if we could get people to stop drinking sweet liquids. Right. That would be, a, we'd have to put it so far out of the curve. Soda pop. And, and, and it's yeah. not just soda pop. It's also fruit juice. It's energy drinks. It's putting sugar in coffee and tea. All the Starbucks right, matcha. Yeah. Right. So that, would be, that would be one place to start, just to not drink sweet liquids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would, that would be a big step. What about alcohol consumption? Eh, I don't, uh, you know, sure. I think you know, the, the whole key with alcohol is moderation. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's constant arguments about whether it's beneficial or harmful. <clears throat> and uh, I think moderation is, is the, the key. key. I don't think that's nearly as big a factor as, as uh, as sugar. sugar. Really? Right. And when you created the anti-inflammatory diet, right? Yeah. When was that? Long ago, and you know, I, I, I have a history of being ahead of the curve in a lot of yeah. areas, you know, that I've been able to foresee trends. I was, I think, the first people to warn people about trans fats 10 years mm -hmm. before people took notice of that. So I became aware of this beginnings of this hypothesis that chronic inflammation was the root cause of a lot of different kinds of serious chronic diseases. And that just fascinated me because when I was in medical school, I was taught that cardiovascular disease had nothing in common with cancer, and that mm. had nothing in common with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's right. disease. And now suddenly it looks like, you know, all of these things are linked. They have a common root of chronic inflammation. inflammation. And, and if that's the case, uh, the good news is then there's a common strategy for dealing with them if you can reduce inappropriate inflammation. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about inflammation. You know, inflammation is the cornerstone of the body's healing response. That's inflammation. So inflammation is good, good. when you're in pain. Well, it's good, you know, it's the way the body gets more nourishment and more immune activity to an right. area that's injured or under attack. Right. So we all know it on the surface of the body. You know, it's redness, swelling, you know, pain, heat. Uh, but we aren't aware of it necessarily internally. 
and especially if it's low level. Uh, it's it, inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it ends when it's supposed to end and stay mm. where it's supposed to stay. So you don't want it throughout your no, body all the time. No, if inflammation persists, if it outlives its purpose, then it causes disease. And it looks now, if you, if you can't produce enough inflammation, you're vulnerable to infection. If you produce too much inflammation, you're vulnerable to allergies and autoimmunity. And it looks like if you've got low level chronic inflammation going on for a long time, you greatly increase risks of cardiovascular disease, of neurodegenerative mm. disease, and cancer. And uh, so I think one of the best things we can do is learn how to contain it. So w what are the factors that influence it? It's partly genetic, it's stress. Exposure to environmental toxins is a big one. Uh, secondhand cigarette smoke is a very powerful pro-inflammatory agent. Really? But diet has a huge influence, and that's one that's potentially under our control. Right. And I think there's no question that the mainstream North American diet is strongly pro-inflammatory. It gives us the wrong kinds of fats, the wrong kinds of carbs, and not enough of the protective elements, which are mostly in fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, tea, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. So what would be the an anti-inflammatory diet? So... Uh, a, a base of high quality produce, uh -huh. you know, and the government always tells us to eat more fruits and vegetables, but the emphasis really should be on vegetables okay. because fruits are sugar sources and you right. want to, you know, veggies, more veggies, more veggies. You want to avoid pro-inflammatory fats, which are things like, you know, hydrogenated fats, margarine, vegetable shortening, and the polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you want to eat olive oil should be your main, main thing. Fat, or avocado oil. Or avocado oil, oil yeah. Gotcha. Uh, nuts, seeds, good. They're good, yeah. Yes. In terms of carbohydrate, it, you know, it's not that carbohydrates are bad. It's that you want to reduce consumption of quick digesting ones, the ones that turn quickly into blood bread? sugar. So everything made with flour. Uh, and that's all the snack foods, all the, you know, it's every, everything, 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 yeah. And, and uh, sweeteners in general. I mean, that doesn't mean you live without sugar completely, but you want to really keep, keep that to a minimum. So is this all flour or is this just more? It's like, all flour. You know, I think the like one of the almond flour and. Well, that's a nut. So okay. that's, that's better. <laughs> but with grains, I, I think there's such misunderstanding. You know, if I ask people, to name a whole grain food, the usual answer I get is whole wheat flour or whole wheat bread. Where's the whole wheat bread is not a whole grain food. Where's the grain? You know, it's and the FDA doesn't get that. They let that put labels on it saying this is a whole grain food and good for you. Most whole wheat bread is colored white bread. Right. You know, when you when you have a grain, the starch is tightly compacted, very dense. And it's surrounded by a more or less by a fibrous bran, and it takes time for digestive enzymes to get in there and convert the starch to sugar. When you mill a grain into flour, whether or not the bran is present, whether or not the germ is present, you convert the starch into a material with an infinite surface area, and it's a snap for digestive enzymes to turn that into sugar. Cacao has been shown to actually double the number of stem cells flowing in your bloodstream just by having two cups of hot chocolate made with 80 percent high flavanol chocolate dark chocolate. come on yeah it's been done in people 60 year olds with heart disease